Hi, I am not Othias, and this is a slightly different episode. <laughs> Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the best groomed I have ever seen Bruno, because he is here for you. Now, uh... <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are coming in late or, you know, years later, uh, we had a gap in the show because uh, I went out to Colorado on a nice motorcycle trip. It's my first actual vacation in four years. And we were also doing the campaign for t-shirts, and that just went atomic. I mean, we yeah. we talked about it beforehand. What did I say? I said, maybe we'll see like 10, 20% increase. That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. We over. more than doubled. Thank you. With like a hundred thousand gross, I'm uh, honestly fairly intimidated by the fact that you guys are that supportive, because now I have to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, I... <laughs> it's a good problem to have. Yeah. No. So um, one of the things that this created though was sort of a gap in the schedule where mm -hmm. I needed to really pay attention to what was going on, and there wasn't a lot of time to build up a, a full episode, and we needed time to sort of roll in the new equipment and we're doing a modified episode, and Bruno here has graciously volunteered to give me a hand with this mm -hmm. because uh, what I've always wanted to do in the past, I mean, since probably about a year into the project, I hear a lot of questions about what does this or that or whatever term mean in terms of bolt-action rifles especially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know what a seer is. I don't know what a... And then the other thing I get a lot of is this is all the same gun over and over. Mm -hmm. These bolt-action episodes are boring. Yeah. Um, there's no real difference between them. And we see it in the numbers. People are much more interested when we cover something like an automatic weapon. Sure. Um, because to them, these guys all look roughly the same. And to us, well, we've become sort of connoisseurs. Yeah, I used to be that way too. Uh, you know, like, yeah, they're all, you know, turn in 90 degrees. It's all the same. But once I start pulling them apart, you're like, no, there's there's differences here. Yeah, it's... Um... It's interesting. Like, mm -hmm. it, yeah. And I think for a lot of you who have been watching the show, you've really gotten a taste of that. But this is a chance to refresh some terms, and it serves as a 101 for people who are coming in. So if you're not that familiar with rifles, this is a good place to start to get an understanding of why there's so many differences and mm -hmm. what they really mean in terms of performance on target, right? Yeah. So um, we're going to break this up into segments. I'm just going to drop a title card for each one, and Bruno and I are just going to freestyle it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get through as much as we can. It's not meant to be absolutely perfect mm -hmm. we debated how to do that and it just became so like yeah. there's so much history so many guns we'd have to mention i think we're going to do a bird's eye get a very brief understanding um and by the way if you're wondering why bruno is involved in this and not may well may is a wonderful markswoman and she's certainly getting used to the history that's going on around here and she's starting to have pretty good understanding of what we're doing mm -hmm. um but she doesn't do the mechanics of the guns. She doesn't hand load ammo. She doesn't do the animations like Bruno does. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't do inspection and repair like Mark and I do. So um, for her to speak in terms of ergonomics and usability, very good. Mm -hmm. That's a role for her. But, you know, Bruno here has to animate everything. I yeah. mean, if it moves, I you gotta, have to cover it. Yeah, i got to make sure it works. Yeah, I've, I've sort of gone a crash course in... Uh, engineering in a way <laughs> just sort of going through all these things and i remember when i first started i was like oh there's so many parts what does that do what is that like i had no choice but to figure out what everything did and at this point i can kind of look at a blueprint and i'm like okay that does that but it was a process of like figuring out what the parts did i don't know about bruno but there's a sort of there's an interesting thing where you make the realization that there is not a single unintentional shape in mm -hmm. any firearm yeah. i mean it, you go and you look at something and you go huh there's a notch here and that's it. That's the rest of your afternoon trying to figure out what the heck that notch was for because yep. there's no reason to put it on there unless it does something and you will mm -hmm. find out that it has some application somehow. Yep. And then also we were talking about this kind of before we set up, but um, because Bruno animates everything, a lot of times, you know, gunsmiths get their hands on something and they have to fix a part or a component of it, but mm -hmm. they don't have to go back through every other single part. Mm -hmm. In Bruno's case, again, like I said, if it moves, he has to animate it. He mm -hmm. has, to, even if it doesn't move, if it's got to be in there for something else's movement to be accomplished, he has to at least define it, yep. you know, measure it and put it in place. So, more so than anybody else on the team, you are intimately familiar with 
every piece of possible movement yes. in a firearm. And then also in order to save time, you copy parts from different oh, firearms. Yep. So you tend to have some insight on sort of the evolution of design. Yeah, because you start to, I, it's weird. I, I always say like, I, I feel like I kind of get in their, in their heads, the designer's heads after a while. Because you start to see, you know, where, yeah, or somebody who came later picked, you know, picked something up from an earlier design and then kind of changed it a bit. Like you can see these like lines kind of sort of spooling out over time of designs and such. Yeah, and it, by the way, not necessarily whole concepts. You'll see weird trigger <laughs> group stuff. The thing about it this way, the Mauser 1871 trigger system essentially reappeared in the tank of air because yeah. it was just that simple. You just, yeah. just need a big spring that yeah. makes the trigger go. If it's not broke, just yeah. keep using it. So um, anyway, we'll uh, we'll get into some details. We're just going to flash some cards for some general mm -hmm. topics, and Bruno will break it down. So let's get started. All right, Bruno, we're selecting a new firearm. Uh, it doesn't even necessarily have to be a bolt action, but where do we start? Uh, well, the round, really, the, the ammunition. Yes, I agree. So uh, there's a lot of options in this because we were talking about bolt action specifically today, but they mm -hmm. go all the way back to something like the green underhammer. Mm -hmm. So that gun is a percussion cap breech loader. It's, it's a weird thing. Yeah. We're not using a casing as we would understand it in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Like... They, you can go pretty far back with bolt actions, but the show yeah. itself is focused on World War One. So mm -hmm. for the most part, we're going to talk about what is considered modern ammunition, mm -hmm. which has four components. That's going to be the powder, the casing, the bullet, and the primer. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, this is going to be true across all ammunition, which is that we have the thing we throw, we have the propellant, mm -hmm. we have a means to secure both, which may be the gun itself in the case of like a muzzle loader, yeah. or there may be a casing that can be even paper. Yeah. And then we have an ignition source, which could be, I mean, everything from a match lock back in the yeah. day, not that it would be bolt action, but, yeah. you know, everything from match and direct fire in the pan all the way up to percussion caps and then yeah. finally center fire as we think of it. Mm -hmm. So in World War One, we mostly tend to see smokeless powder. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we're going to go. With. Let's go with the just sort of what we're putting behind the bullet. Mm -hmm. um, we have two big options here. Smokeless right. and black powder. And it's not really a choice because mm -hmm. black powder was it and there was nothing else. I mean, there are many versions of black powder. But, yeah. but that was your only option. And then all of a sudden the French dropped the label along with the 8mm cartridge. Yes. and Changed the game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, smokeless powder was a big deal. And we've talked about that in our very first episode of the show. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of black powder, what are performance problems with black powder? Why would we want to get away from it other than, you know, it does the job of it throws a bullet. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want. But what? what are the bad things? Yeah. Well, so compared to smokeless powder, there's uh, it's not a very clean burn. So when you burn black powder, there's a lot of residue left behind, a lot of compounds. Some of them, when they mix with water, for example, in the, like in the atmosphere, they produce kind of sulfuric acid, which eats away at your metal, not good. Or they just kind of gum up the, the, uh, the barrel in the action. And if you shoot multiple rounds in quick succession, eventually you get to a point where that gunk just seizes up the gun and it just stops working. And you got to stop and you got to clean it uh, to get it running again, which is not ideal if you're in the middle of a prolonged fight. You don't really want that, so... Uh, there's some sort of uh, chem chemical problems, I guess you would say, with yep. using black powder. I mean, smokeless is smokeless. It's yeah. right there. Uh, there's no residue. Well, not no residue, but there's far, Way far less, less residue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, exponentially less residue. Um, and then, in addition, we're not throwing up a plume of smoke whenever mm -hmm. we fire. Yep. Um, Bruno said it before when we were talking, but you know, you get this artificial fog of war because right. you're literally generating plumes of smoke. I mean, look at a reenactors. Right, right. Yeah. Or you look at some of like the like the old diagrams of like you know like what a Napoleonic era warfare, where it's just like two sides and just the, the smoke clouds kind of running against each other, and you can only fight for you know so long because after a while, there's you can't see anything. You got to wait for I guess the wind to come in, or you you have to move somewhere where you can see the enemy. Yeah. So, um, black powder has some severe disadvantages, and then probably the one that people really don't necessarily click with right off the bat is understanding that black powder burns faster yes. and sort of sharper. It has a much steeper pressure curve it's, yeah, it's, and it's, gone. Yeah. It's so almost you, like an explosion. Yeah, it's just very quick. It's very sharp, and you just send your bullet. So, it all happens in an instant. Mm -hmm. The pressure on the system is in an instant. We talk about smokeless powder, though. What do we got? Sustained pressure? Yeah, you have a curve that's, I mean, and we're talking, you know, milliseconds, but even so, it's a much longer period of of, of shoving the, the projectile uh, down down the barrel. Yeah, and if you wonder how this might fatigue a locking action, well, hold a bowling ball in one hand and another bowling ball in the other, 
and just hold one for one minute, and then hold one for ten minutes. And yeah, compare your pain in your elbows after afterwards. that, because yeah. it's just sustained pressure is much more damaging to a locking system. Just being able to contain a quick <laughs> jolt is not nearly as hard when you're dealing with, you know, metal and wood. Yeah, and it can be tricky to visualize because when you look at it firing, it's just it's so quick that you're like, oh, it doesn't look different. But if you look at a graph or a chart, you know, that, that pressure for that long, especially for a gun, a lot of the earlier black powder ones, they were not designed with that in mind, so they just yield after a while. Yeah, a lot of black powder guns, by the time the bullet leaves the barrel, the energy is almost dissipated anyway. Yeah. With smokeless, there is a freight train of pressure <sighs> just following that bullet all the way through, which actually, by the way, makes smokeless better for things that are gas-operated, but that's, that's beyond a, what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. So, um... Okay, so smokeless powder has more energy, more pressure, and what it really is is that smokeless powder does burn slower, but when you compress it, it does exponentially burn with more power, mm -hmm. whereas when you compress black powder, you can get some mm -hmm. extra yield out of it, but at a certain point, no matter how you, you compress it, you're not getting anywhere. Yeah. While we're talking about powders, uh, the shape of the powder does play a role, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's especially like if you rattle around them, you can hear kind of the, the flakes inside. Yeah, there's you can cut them in a lot of different shapes, and that affects kind of the way they burn when you ignite it. Uh, that can affect sort of the what we call the burn rate. So kind of, and in modern times, even, you know, manufacturers will mix different kinds of powder to get a certain rate of burn to reach a certain velocity. Yep. It's all down to dialing in exactly what you want out of that powder. Yeah, there's now, a whole logistical thing of manufacturing the stuff. It's, yeah. And we'll talk about sort of trajectory when we get into the bullet and barrel, but there's some more to the powder that would just, it's better played out by other rules. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, so we've got our powders. We basically chosen between smokeless and black powder. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not really a choice, it's just time. Yeah. And then, oh, by the way, I should say, there are very good black powders towards the end of the black powder era that did a lot. Yeah, they were squeezing as much as they could out of it before smokeless came around. Right, and, but then you end up with this whole other avenue where it's just like, the sky's the limit. Yeah. And you can just go nuts. It just makes more sense to switch over. Yeah. yeah, the performance of smokeless essentially can exceed the limits of the rifle. Like, you could yeah. just cram as much in there and just blow the whole thing up if mm -hmm. you could. Um, so... We've selected our powder. Mm -hmm. um, if we're thinking in a very old traditional sense, the casing may or may not exist. I mean, they're, like I said, there's well, the green. Yeah, it's either the gun or it's a, a separate thing from the gun. Right. Uh, so we need a way to contain all this. Mm -hmm. um, we'll touch on that in a moment because the one thing we know we need is a bullet. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are we talking about for bullets? Like we're really talking about diameter and then we're talking about maybe length a little bit. But then it gets really wacky. We get into some shapes and things as we get further into history. But... Where are we at, sort of, with the bolt actions? We're really, at the beginning, we're at black powder, mm -hmm. big bore. Yeah. And advantages there? Um, I mean, I guess it's just a lot of, it's a very heavy bullet. Uh, it's not going very fast, but it's still delivering. It's a, it's kind of like a hammer blow. It's a very, it's a, it's a lot of mass being thrown at, at, at target. Um, and it, also... Th uh, this kind of gets into, by the way, while we're talking yeah. about this, because I know we have a lot of sort of newer people to this technology mm -hmm. that are maybe watching this because I know I'm going to put like 101 in the title. Sure. Um, when you talk about on target performance, mm -hmm. you know, and we're, we're talking about bullets hitting flesh. I mean, it's not, yeah, for, none yeah. of us want to be shot. I don't want to no. shoot anybody, but, but that's the war, this is mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Yes. So we want to be able to, or at least militaries at that time wanted to be able to hit a man target mm -hmm. with a bullet and have it do the most damage in terms of yeah. taking somebody out of the line. I don't mm -hmm. know that they want it to hurt. I think they would just want it to halt. Yes. And so when we talk about that, when you're throwing something at 850 feet per second or maybe up to 1,200 feet per second, whatever it may be, black powder moves pretty slowly at mm -hmm. those times. Um, well, power in this case is a function of basically three factors. The two that are critical are uh, speed, and mass. Mm -hmm. And then there's sort of a third factor, which is penetration, because if it goes right through the object, it doesn't deliver as much of that energy as it possibly could. But the mm -hmm. energy on target is speed mm -hmm. and mass. That's what we're really thinking about here. Mm -hmm. If we can't cook the bullet up fast enough, and it's not really that they're thinking this way, but this is the reality of it, yeah. well, we can make it sure as heck heavy. Mm -hmm. And if it's a big, heavy bullet that hits and stays, then it's going to deliver that power. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have big bore guns. Is there any other reason for big bore? Well, one of, well, like we said earlier, one of the advantages is a bigger diameter uh, barrel doesn't get fouled up as quickly with all the residue that black powder has, so you can get more shots off before the whole thing kind of seizes up. That's true. Small bore is exponentially 
uh, more costly in terms of maintenance time for a firearm mm -hmm. in the battle. I mean, to the point that mm -hmm. an eight millimeter with an early black powder, you're going to get a few shots off, and then you're going to need to stop and clean the rifle, and yeah, you're you're, you're still in a fight. Yeah, you don't want to do that. That's not super realistic. Mm -hmm. um, later, black powders burned. You know, more efficiently done black powders didn't leave as much residue. Like, think of the Kropatchik. We talked about the Kropatchik. Sure. It's a black powder gun with a small bore cartridge that was dialed in to be very specific. It's still not as good as a smokeless Yeah, powder. it almost, like, part of me wonders, like, I, I would love to see what would have happened if smokeless hadn't come around quite yet, and they had to keep sort of trying to squeeze more performance out of black powder if they could have gotten to a point where it was truly, you know, not leaving a lot of residue behind. But, you know, yeah. it, it is interesting, because yeah, we're, we really stuff. were moving towards, you know, again, we'll see jagged in a minute, but jagged small bore cartridges mm -hmm. even before smokeless comes around. Smokeless ends up being the excuse to do what people had known that they should have been doing yep. for decades, because it gets rid of the last problems. Yep. So um, we were big bore mm -hmm. for the reasons of power, for the reasons of habit, because a lot of stuff had just been big bore. Yeah. And then uh, for uh, staying clean and functional. Mm -hmm. So small bore, where are advantages there? Uh, well, small bore as compared to big bore. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a smaller projectile, but you can chuck it faster. So you get, like you said, the equation stays the same, right? So yeah, it's, it's not as much mass, but if you can propel it faster, you still have the same amount of impact when it reaches the target. So that's a good thing. Yeah. It keeps the equation the same. The other thing is also a smaller bullet means you can have more bullets per material, per amount of material on the manufacturing side of things. You can make maybe two or three bullets for the weight of one old school kind of big bore uh, lead bullet. Right. And then also that economy goes over to the individual soldier. Right. The weight of five rounds goes down. Yeah. So he can carry a sixth round or a seventh round. Right. And at a time right. when mechanized warfare was not a thing, even rail wasn't a thing. That, that adds up. You know, yeah, that's good to have. Colonies, that sort of thing. Siege warfare was still out there. You yeah. might run out of ammo. Like running out of material and food and ammo was a strong likelihood for how you would lose or win a battle. Mm -hmm. So more ammo, good. Yeah, it's an easy sell for the military. It was like, yeah, you have more shots. Uh, yep. And then the other advantage is if we fire a faster, lighter bullet, we get a secondary advantage, which is mm -hmm. that when we fire big and slow and we want to hit it a thousand yards, we have to fire at a curve, just like firing an arrow through the air. Yeah, there's a, there's a trajectory. Yep. And the faster we go, the more that it curve flattens out of it. Yep. yep. Now, the advantages to that are your often illiterate troops or not the best education troops mm -hmm. no longer have to adjust their sights as, as often yep. for as many ranges. They get to just point. Yeah. And shoot. And there's a bit more leeway in terms of you can be off on your aim more. And because it's flatter, there's not as much drop. So there's more a bigger sort of kill zone, if you will, in right. terms of yeah. where you, you can be off by this much and still hit the target. That is the technical definition of point blank range. Most people think of it as being very close. Not necessarily. But actually, when you fire a shot at an arc, so it, you fire it and it starts rising and then it falls, and then it hits somebody down over here, well, at two possible points, mm -hmm. you could have hit a man-sized target. Those points, that range in which you hit somebody from groin to neck, oh, yeah, sort of those minutes. are the point-blank ranges, two ranges right. yeah, two for points. each gun. Mm -hmm. uh, the flatter it is, the longer the point-blank range, the much more potentially lethal the gun is, especially in massed infantry. So, uh, I mean, very good point, very mm -hmm. clinical definition of point blank range. All right, Bruno, so it's no secret that as we're moving towards World War I in terms mm -hmm. of history, uh, we're looking for a fast firing, uh, flat shooting, small bore, you know, nice little powerful cartridge. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can carry more all that stuff that we just talked about. What's another hang up here that's sort of keeping us back? Because right now, we're all shooting lead bullets. Is, right. is there a limit there? Yeah, and that's one thing they discovered as they started pushing the speed is when you accelerate, lead is a pretty soft metal as far as metals go, and once you push it past a certain speed, it starts to kind of shave inside the rifling, and it kind of leaves residue along with, if it's black powder, right, that's more stuff that's clogging up the barrel, and it's, you know, you're losing mass from the bullet, and it's, you know, it's hanging up, it's, it's no good. So you need a way to kind of smooth up, make sure that it doesn't, it doesn't kind of, shave away like butter basically yeah i mean you're cooking slash i mean you're doing two things you're cooking the crap out of lead yeah which is easy yeah. to do mm -hmm. and then two you have the potential of just shattering it just fragment sure like yeah the, if you push it too much the, yeah. the speed coming out of that barrel can be such that when it hits air 
and it's no longer mm. being contained by the barrel. It's yeah, and it's shot, you know. Yeah, or it gets out a good ways, and it just can't keep it together, and it breaks up further out. Mm -hmm. um, these are real problems that they had to face. And so mm -hmm. we see a lot of technology coming from the Swiss, specifically Eddard it's, Rubin. Yeah, he's kind of central to this whole evolution. Yeah, yeah we've talked about him before. Well, he does a lot of investigation mm. in terms of ballistics. And one of the things that comes out of this is jacketing technology. Right. So... Traditionally lead, by the way, is has been used in firearms mostly because when we get back to muzzle loaders, mm -hmm. um, it's soft, it's readily available. You can ram it in and it will take on enough of the shape of the chamber mm -hmm. that when you fire it back out, it engages the rifling oh. and therefore, you know, well, yeah. not just... Smooth bore even before that, but yeah. you get a nice gas seal. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll conform we'll, itself to the, the right. barrel. Yeah. So uh, when it was smooth bore, it would just seal up, and that gave you the pressure to get mm -hmm. it going. When it was rifled, it sealed up against the rifling so that it would actually start spinning. And then now that we're breech loading, though, we can realistically shove anything in the breech sure. because we can just rake it the right size, and it'll feed through, and that's good. Mm -hmm. But lead sticks around because it's it's been useful, and it's on target performance. It's great. It's yeah. good because it hits, it and it's... It smooshes and it delivers into the target. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, while we're talking about that, let's just take a quick aside. Uh, cavitating bullets. So right. um, we talked about the function of the performance on target as being uh, speed and mass. Mm -hmm. And then also penetration or lack thereof. Right. Well, a mushrooming cartridge, be it solid lead or flat nose lead mm -hmm. or cavitated mm -hmm. lead, the hollow point. Hollow point, yeah. Um, the, the more it sort of diffuses itself into the initial it, target, it like, transfers, yeah, it transfers more of that energy. Mm -hmm. Um, you want to get in there enough to get through clothing, sure. But once you're in there, if you, you can get that to. bullet to spread out, then you're going to deliver all of that power into target. It's going to mm -hmm. do massive bodily damage. Yeah, because once if if you poke through the target, everything after that is wasted wasted energy in right. terms of delivering damage to the target. So, uh, British are known for this with the dum-dum rounds yeah, um, out in probably. India. Mm -hmm. uh, these actually ended up being banned by the Hague. Yeah, they were considered kind of very immoral. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. despite being, frankly, common in American defensive handguns today, sure. um, hollow point's still not allowed mm -hmm. uh, in international war, which is a very odd line to call it. At. Like, yeah, we pushed the technology <laughs> to the point that it was actually very effective, and then everybody went, yeah, it just seems mean-spirited. And yeah, it's like the it's, human cultural element came in and took away that technological tier of mm -hmm. potential damage from a bullet. And there's a lot of people that argue about that today because, I mean, in the modern context, this is still very charged because oh, yeah, people say that forth. hollow points are being used against soldiers in certain battlefields, mm -hmm. but that the armies that go there then have to use less effective cartridge. It's, right. like, it's still a debate. I mean, yeah, it's a debate that's over 140 years old in a yep. lot of ways. So, um, but that's mushroom technology. Lead provides some of this mm -hmm. same effect. Right. Um, but lead is now breaking up on us. Yeah, we got to find a way to, to make sure it, it retains its shape until it hits the target. So we gild it. We just cover it Maybe in it a harder metal. But mm -hmm. there is a limiting factor here. Yeah, you don't want it to be so hard because you could make it, for example, out of steel, right? But then it would, if it's as hard as the barrel, then it's just going to scratch the heck out of it. And then that's no good. Yep, you're going to erode your barrel. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get on target, you're going to over penetrate. Right. Because it, you, need, you need a jacket that's right going to surrender to the, to the target enough to let the lead do its job. Right. Um, so we end up with things like malachort or right. like sort of weird copper yeah, alloys. Yeah, alloys. Yeah, there's yep. always some weird mix. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that technology is why. In our show, we don't do ballistic shell testing because unless yeah, we could, it, unless we can replicate the actual jacketing technology, it's not a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, we you could say that this does this much. You know, if we take an eight millimeter ordnance revolver and shoot it into a ballistics block, it's not going to do very well mm -mm. because it's set up for a type of malachort that we don't have. Yeah, and. It's yeah, just if, impossible, guys. If you want to be accurate about it, yeah, there's yeah. just no way to do it. So jacketing technology comes around, it holds the bullet together, and yet still provides enough yield. Right. And then jacketing technology also allows for the next couple of developments that are really cool. Yes. Which is that, and I've seen, I, I can't, I have never pinned down exactly where it came from it's cool to in terms it, of the yeah. research, but I have seen as early as the 1880s, uh, the French being very excited in technical mm. manuals about photographing bullets in flight. Right. They had a huge, weird rig with a little bit of smoke in the air and all these electrochemical 
components, and yeah, they managed to capture set. these terrible resolution photos <laughs> of yeah, bullets in flight. Still amazing. But what they could see is they could see the airwaves coming off of these things. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying that this is the origin of all of this, but I'm saying that this is the sort of thing people were just learning about at right. that time. They were excited to know this aerodynamic stuff. There's no airplanes. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, you know what I mean? Like aerodynamics is a very hard field that you can't really see or yeah. record until the technology is there. Yeah, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So before, our bullets were, well, the original ones were just round. Yeah, just a sphere, yeah. I mean, and it's easier we, to make, really. Yeah, we end up with things like mini balls, which are sort of right. conical. Yeah. And with a hollow cavity at the rear to sort of push. This is actually a very early sense of what we're heading towards. Right, yeah. Even if they didn't necessarily understand the science behind it, they knew that certain shapes performed better when flying through the air as right. opposed to a ball. So uh, at this point, we're really looking at round-nosed, long cylindrical. So Coke mm -hmm. can and a ball yeah. at the end. Um, these work because we're really like, we got this long bullet so that they have as long as possible to engage the rifling on the surface area, yep. really get spiraled up. And mm -hmm. then they're sort of just, they're supposed to be laid out linearly so that they go nice and straight, mm -hmm. but they're, they're round nosed because round nosed is just sort of a naturally even symmetrical shape that'll go through the air. If mm -hmm. they tried making them pointed, and don't get me wrong, they tried. I mean, mini balls can get pretty pointed. Mm -hmm. um, you run into problems where they want to tumble sooner. Yep. Um, yeah, they just start yeah, spinning. Yep. And uh, this would all actually... So it's not that we didn't even know that we did... We, we might want a pointed bullet, but we're not really doing it because it doesn't work. Right. Well, bottlenose cartridges, as we've been talking about so far... Give way later on. Um, weirdly, there were experiments done way early, and then it gets sort of abandoned until yeah. almost like 1908. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's a it, weird gap. Yeah. It, it, we talked about this series. There's some stuff that sort of should have been around much sooner, and then there's other stuff that sort of shows up really early and confuses everybody. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah this, in alternate realities, you could have had Spitzer right away. Mm -hmm. In alternate realities, you could have had 30 more years before Smokeless. Like yeah. it's it's wild. That these things dropped when they did and mm -hmm. caused all this confusion in this one period. But mm -hmm. by 1908, we're definitely seeing what's known as the Spitzer bullet, which is yeah, a pointed kind of bullet. Pointed, yeah. But more importantly, it has a mm -hmm. boat tail. Yeah, so it kind rear. of narrows back down at the very end. Yep. Uh, often maybe just flat or a little bit concave. Yeah, that might be a little. And bent. all that is, is it's just like a boat moving through the water. It's mm -hmm. just designed to, just to guide that rear air flow so that, that as that drag that's coming off the back of the bullet starts riffling. It's not putting movement on the back of the bullet and disturbing the bullet's flight yeah, or stays, creating a vacuum that sort of destabilizes yeah, the bullet. It stays and nice and, yep. and steady. So the Spitzer bullet goes farther, straighter. It's self-stabilizing. It's like throwing a football. I mean, it's, yeah, it's the same, exactly similar, like pretty much a similar shape. Yeah, yeah. just kind of stretched out. Mm -hmm. Yep. And imagine trying to throw a football that if you just stretched a football out and cut the end off and made it square and throw that, mm -hmm. it's not going to go nearly mm -hmm. as well for the air. So the Bowtail bullet uh, Spitzer comes out. Uh, jacketed, obviously. Right. Um, there are some problems with it, which is that coming off the bottlenose, what have we lost? Well, you have to shave away some of the material to get that shape, right? Because the bottlenose is straight and then it just, you get a little dome, where here it's pointed. So you're losing mass when you make a, a spitzer round, and that can that will affect sort of the, 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 the equation. Right. Um, so in other words, we have less sectional density, right. which means on target performance, not necessarily as good if we mm. keep the speed the same. So we have to play a game of ramping up the speed mm, yeah. and not directly over penetrating the target. Yeah, it's give and take, yes. Yeah. Mm. And so they ramp up the speed, which they can do right. because the jacket's right. holding it together. Right. But mm. also the pressure on the rifle's going down right. because we have lower surface area engaged against the rifling. So actually the Spitzer can, will wear a barrel out less. Yes. Yeah, there's technically. Less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than a bottlenose because there's just less surface area Yeah, engaging. it's not rubbing as much of the rifling each time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So brilliant technology. Yeah. Uh, absolutely becomes the standard. And then, by the way, another thing about this jacketed technology and this sort of spitzer shape, all these things that we're seeing, mm -hmm. um, jacketing uh, allows for things like having steel cord ammo for armor sure. piercing Yeah. so that you can get through shields and things like that. Yeah, or uh, incendiary stuff uh, yep. later on the line. Yep. yep. Uh, all this gilding gives you the ability to sort of make a deliverable package. Yeah, this is a... really high bullet technology. It's just a shell. Yeah, you can cram whatever you want in it. Really. Yeah, you, you now have sub-components of the bullet when it used to just be lead in its shape. Right. Okay, so uh, we've talked about bullet and powder. Mm -hmm. uh, what's next? Well, I think we got to talk about casings. Okay. But before we do, again, 
Um, that's not necessarily a requirement for a bolt action rifle. Two good yeah. examples of this would be like the German Dreiser needle rifle mm -hmm. and the French Chasse, uh, Chasse. Uh, I just did myself the French <laughs> yeah. Uh Both of these guns are needle fire and right. use paper car paper cartridges. Yeah, it doesn't have to be metal. Yeah, it can be something else. Okay, so casing technology and primer technology kind of go hand in hand mm -hmm. because a lot of one is dependent on the other. Now, mm -hmm. as we're coming into this era, uh, we have percussion cap and we have mm -hmm. needle fire, like we just said. Um, both of these, like percussion cap, you don't even need a casing. Mm -mm. Like you just. There's a, a, the, the, the igniter is the percussion cap. It smacks, it sparks, done, it yeah. throws a little bit of fire, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm greatly simplifying this. This sure. is a bird's eye view. So uh, that would then set off the powder. Powder drives the bullet. Mm -hmm. um, and we had the needle fire bolt action rifles, which is sort of like the beginning of the bolt action mm -hmm. really getting its credit because mm -hmm. um, that's like the one advantage is that you can sort of breach load very quickly right. and very simply. Uh, but it's dependent on having self-contained ammunition. Yeah. And so just a, it's a paper thing with a primer compound down in the middle yeah. and then a needle penetrates it, gonna, yep. sets it off, boom. Um, here's something interesting though. We have all this gas and pressure and mm -hmm. material um, that wants to go somewhere. It's, we have to keep yeah. it from going anywhere. We only want it to go them, yeah. Yeah, out forward. Yep. Mm -hmm. So on those previous systems, they have to have ways of containing all this. Right, because uh, otherwise the, it's going to leak yep. everywhere. The Dreiser was sort of finely fitted with sort of set cones. Mm -hmm. And then the... Uh, the Chaspo had a little, I think, rubber, 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 rubber operation, operation rings. Yep. yep. That would kind of expand and make a seal. Well, yeah, they just sort of, when they got hit, they just... Yeah, they, they kind of puff up and, yeah. But they wear very quickly. Mm -hmm. You have to replace them. Yeah, especially if you buy, like, you know, a mo you know, in modern times, if you buy one, they'll be kind of cracked and you should probably get a new one. Otherwise, yep. it's not going to work. So, uh, yeah, would highly recommend yes. having fresh rubber for your chassepo. Yes. Um, so, really, we need a way to sort of seal the breach. And, mm -hmm. by the way, paper cartridges let water in. I mean, they're very sensitive yeah, they're, to, they're to outside yep. conditions. So, mm -hmm. um, what we're going to do in this show is all brass cartridge. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're we're really not for World War One. It's At all point, yeah, brass cartridge. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it's pretty much all center fire, except for I think like the Ottoman handguns. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. so, when we say center fire, um, early early brass cartridges in a lot of ways were just drawn brass with one opening at the end right. and they had a rim on the back that was sort of hollow bodied and you could put priming compound yeah, all around a, in there. A disc if you will, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you would pinch it and it would cause it to detonate and mm -hmm. then that would shoot it. Uh, that's rim fire. Right. Um, so the priming compound's in the rim. Uh, yeah, this yeah. is the modern equivalent, 22 LR. Yeah. So yeah. everybody's handled it if you've handled a firearm, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, and so 22 LR is known for being pretty cool and a lot of people would not bet their lives on it because Rim fire, rim primed cartridges are not known as being super reliable. There's so, more chance for them to not work. Yeah, that's why if you'll notice a lot of times with rim fire uh, guns, they'll have more than one pin to smack because you want to smack it in more than one place just in case the one point you pick just doesn't want to work. Right. Uh, the good example of this is the Swiss Betterly series. Right. These are 41 Swiss rim fire, um, mm -hmm. and they were a military rifle that lasted for decades, yep. but. The rim fire technology was really not anything anybody wanted this with. Mm -hmm. So instead, we end up with center fire primers, right. which is universal throughout yeah. World War One mm -hmm. and on into the day. I mean, yeah, really, still, yeah. we've had attempts at electronic ignition and other things. None of it's taken off. Center not, fire. Not yet. It's here for to stay for a while. Yeah. I think <laughs> center <laughs> fire primed metallic cartridge mm -hmm. is standard. I mean, even now. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Okay, we talked about priming compound. The case itself, uh, in this case, brass cases. Now we see them in other materials. But uh, brass cases, mm -hmm. what they did is when the shot was fired, while that gas expands, the brass actually swells to fill the dimensions of where it's at. Yep. Hopefully not too, too far. Much, yeah. Or else it'll crack. But if it swells up and doesn't crack, well, then it contains all the gas and it shoves it cool. forward. Or not shoves it, but it prevents it from going anywhere else and therefore it must go forward. Right. So um, brass cased ammo solved the obturation problem, not with a firearm mechanism, but with an ammunition mechanism. So that's a function of the brass casing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, we've sealed our breach. We've sent our round. We're now pretty much waterproof. I mean, you can't soak them, but, you know, yeah. we're doing way better than paper cartridges. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty waterproof. Um, in terms of case technology, there is an interesting thing, which is that uh, we have to make a decision on almost to the point of World War One. people were still deciding mm -hmm. on. Rim versus unrimmed rounds. Yes. All right, Bruno. So why would an army want to go with a rim cartridge? 
So the RAM allows you, for one thing, it, it allows extraction of a case. Uh, as far as the gun mechanism goes, it gives you a shelf, basically, you can, you know, pull the, the case out. And consequently, as well, for the human hand, you know, it kind of gives you somewhere to some nice easy place to grab and just chuck the case yeah nobody, or load nobody, a new one. nobody wants a bandolier of rimless cards yeah it would just fall right through yeah, yeah. so okay <laughs> easier handling especially right. with single shots right like with, yeah you look like something maybe like a martini henry or something like especially if you don't uh if you don't work the action hard enough to fling the case out you can just grab it by the rim and just whoop, chuck yep. it that's pretty easy um as far on top of that there's sort of a ease of manufacturing kind of thing going on uh, especially when you're trying to hold the headspace of a round, you only have to worry about the thickness of that rim because that's what sets the depth when you insert the round all the way so, into the action. So this is another time for a good definition, right? Headspace. Mm, yes. So headspace, in a sense, is... Let me, let me give you an example. If I were to put my fist here on Bruno and apply 10 pounds of force, right? Mm. It's not going to do anything because I've already been in physical contact with him. But if I withdraw my fist Even just and bit. swing 10 pounds into his arm, I don't know that he's going to get a bruise. He's a pretty hardy guy, but oh, he's going to feel it a lot more. more. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the same thing. When we hold the cartridge in the gun, we want enough tolerance. We want enough variability in here to be able to fit different ammos that have slightly different dimensions. And we don't want to over crank the round mm -hmm. because if we over crank Straight the round, we'll compress the case, we'll get ripples in the case. And when we fire, we'll it have might. ruptures and other That's problems. Yeah. So if we allow for too much space to the rear though, if we walk it too far out, That's also bad. that cartridge when it goes bang, well, the math on that is pretty impressive. Actually. Yeah. Um, you think, oh, like a half a millimeter of extra space. That's not a lot. Um, with it's, the forces involved, yeah. It's, uh, you watch it's Kill lot. Bill with that punch. Right, like, yeah. I so mean, it, uh, right through the, the wood every time. Because yeah. it, you leave even a half mil of space in that, and you will get blowout. You'll get hot gas in your face. Yeah, I mean, the the the, the powder is, is pushing on all all sides, and yeah. you want it to go out. If you, if you give it any space in the back, it will take it. It, it doesn't discriminate. It'll push, and... It, worst case, you might get, you know, like we said, it'll break the case and then you have gas venting yeah. back, which is not good because that's where the person well, is. We've seen the worst case when we tried shooting right. 6.5 betterly. We mm. had an unsupported case at the rear. Yeah. We didn't notice it when we were doing our Ooh. experimenting. Blew up. And just, I mean, just a little fragment of case that was unsupported and boom, blew, blew out the whole magazine well. I had wood splinters everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was gnarly. Yeah. yeah, headspace counts. And so when you're doing a rimmed cartridge, well, the only headspace you care about is between sort of the back of the receiver or bolt or barrel, you know, mm -hmm. and the bolt head. Now, this could be done two ways. You can have a recess in the yeah, receiver slash barrel mm -hmm. and a flat bolt head, or you can have a, a flat barrel slash receiver mm -hmm. and a cupped bolt head. But realistically, only one component needs to be shaped mm -hmm. to have the headspace. Yeah. And, and we should point out, we're talking also, you know, maybe late 19th century you know, manufacturing technology, they're not necessarily, the precision maybe is not as good as modern manufacturing. So if you tell them, hey, you only got to worry about this one, okay, well, that's less chance to sort of screw up a measurement. Right. And it's only one thing to inspect. You don't mm -hmm. have to do any math. You don't have to nope. inspect this depth and that depth and add them and then say that checks out. Yeah. Uh, which what we're alluding to is head spacing on a rimless case. Yeah. Because head spacing on a rimless case means that we have to take it on the shoulders of the case. Mm -hmm. And at the very rear. So you're talking about an entire cylinder, well, a conical cylinder right, yeah, of surface area mm -hmm. that you must have at the right depth to a flat. Right, I yeah. mean, the math on that alone. And then yeah, now it's... we have to have the, the sort of depth of the chamber and we have to have the depth of the recessed bolt face or whatever is going to grab it. Okay, that adds a lot of complexity. Yeah, there's a lot less room for error, and you have to have much, I think, more precise manufacturing tolerances to make sure that, because you're manufacturing this in the millions of you know right. rounds, potentially. So That's a huge cost. And then the other thing that it does is that a rimless cartridge is actually usually harder to eject in some ways. Now, on right. bolt actions, they're usually using an extractor technology that's roughly applicable to the rim and the rimless. Although I will say... When you have to create a notch in the receiver for a rimless round, you must put that notch closer to the center line of what is now the empty cavitated space for the chamber. Mm -hmm. Well, that's getting a chance to be a weaker part of the gun yeah, than that's... elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, a uh, little bit of an extraction penalty there. Certainly, if your extractor slips over and you have to fish it out by hand, Ugh. not nearly as fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
why the heck would we want to go with rimless ammo? Yeah, it just seems like a lot of work for no gain. But one thing you gain is when you get rid of the rim, right, you get rid of that protruding bit, uh, you eliminate a lot of chances for what we call rim lock. So rounds sort of, the rims of rounds kind of getting stuck together and so this jamming the whole thing an emphasis thing up. on a magazine rifle. Can you see any reason for a single shot rifle to go with a rim? No, the single shot, that's not a problem because you're doing one round at a time. So there's never going to be a chance for rounds to jam you're up. You're only, only, only adding yeah, complexity. You know, it doesn't matter there, yeah. Now, yeah, as soon as you adopt a magazine system and you put rimmed rounds in it, now, yeah, you might have that potential to for rounds to snag. And now you have to sort of engineer... The magazine, maybe the f you know the way it feeds, like you have to work around the problem. I think like Lee Enfield's a good example of it. like they have to do a lot of work to get it just right so that it doesn't snag because you don't want that you know in the middle of a fight. So a rimless round gets rid of that problem. You basically have a cylinder, and then it's much easier to feed, and there's less, less chance for it to snag on stuff. Yeah, so the rimless round really is a selection for repeated fire. Yeah, which is I think is more exponential if you're dealing with like automatic stuff, machine guns, that sort of thing. That's, I think, where you notice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some gun systems like belt feds you, that don't mind a rim round. You can make it work, yeah. But I think we've reasonably seen that, I mean, is there a rimmed service cartridge that's still really out there? I mean, 7.62 in some places, yeah. because, but that's legacy. Like, I still yeah, think those just, systems yeah. would work better no or be sure. easier to manufacture or much easier to research if they had had a rimless round. So, yeah, it I think it really comes down to a, a, a logistical sort of manufacturing thing. Is like, if, you're, if you have a, a rim round and you want to go to rimless, that's a whole cost, not just in retooling, but you got to make sure you're able to maintain that level of precision for billions of rounds. That's that's a gamble for you know a, a military or a government. So those of, you, those of you who might laugh at like a rimmed round, don't. There's actually a technological reason for why it was, mm -hmm. and then there's a technological reason for why it wasn't. A good example of where the rim round really hurt technology was the attempt by the French to adopt any sort of semi-automatic rifle using the absolutely terribly balanced 8mm yes. ordnance cartridge. Because that was a Gras, 11mm Gras cartridge, neck down aggressively neck to 8mm. Yeah. And then they created this weird shoulder. There's like no strong parallel lines in the whole thing. You can tell they were in a rush when they made it. Yeah. And so it works in a tube loader, like a tubular magazine did fine with it. But sure. you try to apply it to any other system and it's just a nightmare. Uh, you basically have to control the feed of each round precisely to get it to work. Mm -hmm. It really was a problem for them, and they needed to move away from it pretty quickly. And it still stuck around until World War II. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of those things where it's like you really want to get things right before you go down the road because sometimes it's just impossible to turn. The oh, shit. yeah. All okay. right, so I think we got ammo kind of wrapped up. There's a million other things we could say. Sure. We could do hours on ammunition alone. Mm -hmm. Again, bird's eye view, and this is already going to be a long episode, I can tell. So, let's get on to our next little segment. I really hope that we're showing the complexity of this process, because uh, I guarantee you we're at least half an hour in now, and we've only selected ammo. There's a lot of variables, yeah. yeah. So, uh, still not specific to bolt-action rifles, but the mm -hmm. next decision is going to be the barrel. Right. I mean, more so than the action. Because the barrel is what guides the bullet and projects it in the right way. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about barrels, uh, probably our first thought is going to be a combination of length and rifling. Let's just go for rifling first. What is rifling? What's it doing for us? Right. So if you look at a cross-section of a barrel, rifling are basically these sort of helical cuts sort of going spinning down the barrel. And when you fire a, a projectile through a rifled barrel, you impart sort of a gyroscopic spin on the bullets and kind of like throwing a football. We know that if we spin things, it makes them, they keep the, the, the vector that they're flying in much better. Uh, hence, you know, that's why they're rifles. That's what defines a rifle, really. You is. can tell we're both physicists. Right, yeah, yeah. I'm not. From yeah. this high <laughs> level language. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, essentially, we know if we make something spin, it, it, it keeps its, its target better. So that's why we want to impart a spin on a bullet as we fire it. Now, you could have a smooth bore bolt action. Okay. Um, there's examples in the shotgun world, certainly, mm -hmm. but that's not what we're talking about today. And mm -hmm. technologically, the rifling was there by the time the breech loading bolt action came around. Sure. So we're going with rifling. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about rifling, there's a number of factors, and this gets into a whole crazy <sighs> physics science. Oh, man, yeah. Let's keep it light. So number one, shape. Sure. Yeah. So you kind of have to def you have to define what the shape of the rifling will look like. Right. Do um, we want to make blocks that come up and square off or right. do we want to put sort of divots in that are nice and soft and round mm -hmm. and sort of guide the bullet like a hug 
Yeah. And this affects damage to the bullet. This affects uh, engagement of the bullet and how much rate. So manufacturing sometimes, yep. depending on what you pick, will be easier, harder to make. It's Some cool. are more susceptible to what's called a squib, where the mm -hmm. friction on the bullet is so high and the powder load is wrong. And it sort of stops midway down the barrel. But in some cases, you can have dangerous squibs. Like yeah, you can have are, are rifling that doesn't have enough depth for the bullet to allow gas over or something like that. And we saw bursts on the Gavari 88. The Gavari 88 right. was a very good example of this. And we also see things like polygonal rifling. Yes. Um, which was an attempt yeah. actually in the black powder era to really control the bullet while also allowing the most uh, uh, escape for the fouling and other issues and easier cleaning and less degradation Mm -hmm. of the rifle so i mean there's a lot of i could do a whole thing on rifling patterns sure um we're not going to get that far down into this you guys get the idea uh the other thing is twist rate right. so twist rate is a word that you'll probably hear that's mm -hmm. how long in distance terms yeah. it takes to get one full turn of the spiral mm -hmm. and so if you spin up a bullet faster earlier versus spinning it up slower the and then we can even see something such as gain twist gain twist yep. Um, what rifle used Game Twist that we know of from World War One? Uh, oh man, Carcano. You're and right, he yes. is of Italian heritage, so shame yeah, on Bruno. Yeah, I should have remembered. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, while well, I'm quizzing you on air, uh, right. so the Game Twist rifling was a military secret at the time. But what were they trying to avoid here? Throat erosion, which right. is that we have a bullet, we speed it up very quickly. Yeah, super quick. Uh, it engages the rifling, and there's friction there. It's a lot, and of force. it goes from not rotating to suddenly rotating very quickly that creates a lot of friction at, especially at the throat where it's right. first being spun up yeah. so if we have rifling that starts off slow it's and then tightens up yeah. well we have a chance to not necessarily damage the throat of the gun as fast and we get more shots out of the rifle before right. you, yeah, you burn out the, the barrel yep so there's gain twist rifling right. um, so there's a lot of considerations around rifling that's sort of the short story I don't mm -hmm. again we're not going to beat this one to death um, other barrel selection properties. Another one that comes to mind, length. Yes. So what are the advantages to a long barrel? Well, uh, the longer you make the barrel, the more uh, room there is for the powder to really push the bullet as much as it can before it leaves yep. the barrel. And this actually gets really important in weirdly, like we tend to think of long barrel as being older. Right. But realistically, smokeless powder makes a longer barrel way more efficient. Yes. Um, realistically, like the differences between long and short barrel and the black powder era, they were there, but mostly for the stabilization of the bullet, not mm -hmm. so much for the oomph. The oomph is really delivered early in a black powder system. Mm -hmm. So smokeless powder, though, long barrel really pushes it. Another consideration for long barrels at that time was that people were firing in lines. Yeah, it's kind of a holdover from sort of earlier ways of fighting, but yeah, if you have a lot of people lined up, yeah, you, you want the barrel to stick out beyond the head of the guy in front of you because yeah. you don't want to get... <laughs> you would you would have like a, a line of guys mm -hmm. and they would shoot and then there's a line of guys that was offset by one. They would shoot between the first guys right. while the other ones were reloading and mm -hmm. you just alternate fire. I mean, you could do this several deep, but usually just two, two is yeah. the way we think of it. Yeah. But the thing is, if you have a shorter barrel rifle, uh, well, you're clanging uh, off right next to the ear of the guy beside you. You're disrupting what he's doing. Problematic. Yeah, yeah it's not so good. So, um, outside of firing in the line and sort of just wanting to have more pressure on the bullet, mm -hmm. like we said, longer time in the barrel can help stabilize a bullet. But the Spitzer cartridge radically improved the stabilization of a bullet yeah. in and of itself to the point that a lot of when we're in World War One, people are still the French are still adopting long barreled <sighs> semi automatic rifles. Yeah. Because they want the firing in a line, they want the stabilization. They don't need it. They're not firing in a line. Mm -mm. And the stabilization is already there. A much yeah, shorter barrel gets the same stability. A certainly serviceable stability. It's definitely one of those takeaways you see after the war where the people realize we don't really need this much barrel right. for the performance we want. We can cut it down. Um, an example of people who did not stay with a longer barrel would be the United Kingdom and the United yeah, States, both of which went with standard short rifles. Kind of ahead of, ahead of the curve in a way, yeah. Now, there's some other factors in having a shorter barrel rifle. It's not just that you can have one, because even when it wasn't super efficient to have a short barrel rifle, they'd still do it. Can you think of some examples? Short sort of carbines, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cavalry, for the most part. Cavalry, artillery. People who have something to do other than march with the rifle at mm -hmm. their shoulder. Um, so this is a handling choice. It's the ability to sort of tuck the rifle up where it doesn't need, you know, where it mm -hmm. needs to be temporarily. You know, whip it out when you need it. Right. Cavalry is very much the traditional sense of this. 
Um, we can also think of light infantry that use shortened rifles, mm -hmm. so like the Jaegers, right. or the Casadores, like we just mentioned in mm -hmm. Portugal. And, and again, from the uh, sort of the material manufacturing side of the equation, a shorter barrel means you're spending less metal and wood and, and manufacturing time to crank out a rifle, which yes. adds up, especially when you're making them mass mass scale. Yeah, and uh, as a final point, we're going to see this more when we talk about sights in a second, but also barrel length mm -hmm. sets up for sight radius, yes. which is the distance between the front and rear sight, and we'll get there in just a moment, but just know, longer barrel, longer sight radius. Yes. Okay. So, um, that really is sort of the concern for the barrel in the, the, the most known sense, but sort of an invisible influence in the barrel is harmonics. This is something mm, that people, yes. uh, even I don't understand completely well. I mean, I understand there's of, why. There's a lot of math, yeah. Yeah, I, I understand that when we have a, a pressure wave moving through a gun like this, I don't care if it's metal or what, everything it, flows. Yeah. And there's a ripple effect and a vibration like a tuning fork. Mm -hmm. And so also as the gun heats up, it's going to change. Like the metal's going to expand. Bit, yeah. There's gonna be slight differences in there that are gonna matter downrange. And so you have to provide an avenue for that expansion that does not interrupt the barrel harmonics. So mm -hmm. I fire a gun dead cold. Mm -hmm. And when I fire it, the barrel has X amount of vibration that's predictable and a little bit that's unpredictable. So the predictable vibration, we can zero the sight. Zeroing meaning we fire a shot, we see where it hits on paper, we line up the sight to match that, and then now whenever we shoot the gun, we Always hit what there. we point at, right? Mm -hmm. In the general sense, at certain ranges and certain air pressures, yeah, you know, a, what, all a sorts fixed of things. Point, yeah. yeah. So uh, if we have a lot of wildly variable barrel harmonics, if we haven't you know bedded it correctly, if we don't have a way to sort of tie down the front or bed the front of the action, well, Starts. then it can just. Go Everywhere anywhere, and it'll yeah. never it's called not holding zero. It will not hold zero. Yeah, this is infamously yeah. something that was said to be wrong with the British number Early. five jungle carving. Yes Yeah, so mechanically we can try to control this uh, a few different ways uh, On one end of the spectrum you can say you can try to leave the barrel sort of what we call free floating So we don't touch it anywhere. We let it expand when it heats up kind of flex do its thing and that way, it, it hopefully produces a reproducible vibration each time you fire. And right. That, by the way, that is key. It's not just the randomness of each shot. It's also, once it gets hot, it needs room to sort of find its place again. Mm -hmm. um, so free-floated. Yeah. And this sort of comes about, for example, some like the Belgian Mauser 89 with a barrel jacket where they were putting a sort of a thin steel jacket around the barrel and, you know, they were letting it kind of float. Yeah, so own. in the Belgian 89, where the barrel's attached to the receiver, yep. and then all the way at the front, sort of resting in... Just, yeah. Yeah, just resting in the front of this barrel yes, jacket yeah. that runs all the way down the stock. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that is, yes, it creates this cavity of air. And by the way, we'll talk about this a little bit later. The barrel jacket also allows for heat insulation. Yes. Um, but it's thin metal. It's easily dented. Yeah, also uh, it gathers problems with moisture yep. and getting water in there and rusting stuff. Not a great solution. But mm -hmm. the idea was sound, I think. Yep. And by the way, the alternative to free floating is just tie it all down. Just, 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 yeah, just clamp it. Just clamp it all down. The Which British is, are, again, I think the British are a good example of just really clamping it. At down. one point, then they go with something else. But uh, sure. the one I think of is like the Mauser 71, 71, yeah, that, yeah, where they had it nice and clamped at the front and rear, and then it just... It just went it, anywhere anyways. Yeah. As it heated up, it just wandered because you're trying too hard to control it. And so if you're holding something at the front of the rear really tight, and it starts heating up and it wants to expand yeah. somewhere, and it can't go forward, and it can't go back, it's going to go... It's going to bend. Yeah. Like, in a way you can't even perceive, yeah. but enough to throw off your shot. And so um, we start to see other weird inventions. So, like, the British tend to have it sort of yeah, controlled at the rear and a mm -hmm. little controlled at the front. But then what they do is to try to take out that vibration. They have a plunger with a spring yeah. that sets up under the barrel that gives it some rested support. But does it just keeps a certain amount yeah. of pressure on there. It's very tricky. Mm. This is all in response to... You can chase that problem forever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the original Lee Metford, Lee Enfield had they were having horrible problems. accuracy problems mm -hmm. because they were just straight pipes in wood stocks and no real way to, to deal with all that problem. So, mm -hmm. um, now mind you, in World War One they weren't that inaccurate because mm -hmm. we're shooting at shorter ranges, but they're trying to shoot thousand yard oh, yeah, whatever's yeah. in the Boer War. Mm -hmm. So... 
Okay, the British go with like a weird dampener. The Belgians free float it with a jacket. Mm -hmm. um, the Germans just at first just clamped it down. Uh, the ultimate thing by World War One, the really standard that we tend to see is what's known as a stepped barrel. Mm -hmm. So this is a barrel that is thicker and it suddenly thins back out at a little. There's like a little notch, mm -hmm. like a little yeah. bevel, mm -hmm. and it just boop, and it goes down, and it goes for a while, and boop, and down. And what that's doing is that's allowing for the heat to sort of find different zones in the barrel. Like it's controlling the expansions that happens in predictable places. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is when they fit it for the stock, they can support the barrel gently, mm -hmm. but they have these extra notches mm -hmm. in the wood so that if, when the barrel wants to expand, it will expand right. in that direction, knowingly mm -hmm. in that direction. And then there's room in the stock to allow for that expansion. And that keeps things nice and tight yeah. even when the barrel heats up. Uh, that tends to be the technology that is pretty standard in World War One. We'll see exceptions to this, but that's about where we're at. Mm -hmm. So that is not everything that goes into barrel selection by even, let's say, 4%. If we were an ordnance department, we'd be way down oh, into some crazy details. Yeah. But that gives you an idea. All of this ammo and barrel is before we've selected the breech action of a bolt-action rifle. So when you say these guns are all the same... Mm. Uh, no, like even we're not even to the category that you're saying is the same yet. Right, we've seen lots of. Yeah, games. right now it's just a rifle. It could be anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that. Let's get into the action. All right, we're finally into the bolt action. Action. Okay. Right. Uh, what would we have chosen other than a bolt action? Uh, basically, some sort of breech block. System. Yeah, um, we tend to think of this when we think about the, uh, well, actually the Winchester 1894 lever action that we sure, talked about. Yeah. That uses a rising and falling breech block that's operated by a lever. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a breech block gun with a lever operation. Mm -hmm. um, the Martini Henry is another breech block gun with yeah, a pivots. Tipping, yep. Yep, and a lever action. Yes. Yeah, and um, I mean, there's there's other guns, Werder and things like that. Like sure, yeah, there's, there's tons. Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking about a single shot rifle. Mm -hmm. No magazine. Um, are there any real advantages to a bolt action over a breech block? Not really, uh, because you're yeah you're manually inserting. You're doing a lot of the cycle, the parts of the cycles of operation. So no, yeah. no real... In terms of speed, the average serviceability to a soldier, not a huge difference. No, not really. I, I will say the bolt action does often present, and there's breech block guns that have other issues, but like mm -hmm. Remington rolling block, we pop or open. And we have to aim and shove in the cartridge. Mm -hmm. That's not a very gross motor control issue. No. Um, now the martini, though, we pop it open, we slap it down. We still kind of have to guide it into. So the one thing that I've noticed with bolt actions over a lot of breech block guns is that they tend to drive, by the action of sort of resealing the gun, we drive the cartridge. That's the big thing at the, the early stages, is that mm -hmm. you don't have to guide the cartridge into the chamber all the way mm -mm. and then snap it up. Yeah, you just kind of plop it there. Yeah. And then... If you if you get a cartridge halfway into a martini and crank the lever, you're going to bend the cartridge. You know yeah, what I mean? But in a bolt action, you don't, even have to, you don't have to try. You just slap it down on these early single shot bolt actions, mm -hmm. and then you just bolt forward, that drives the thing in, and you're you turn down for lock. So really, the locking part is just that last turn down. Yep. But with the bolt, you're already doing that that linear thing that you would have to have done with your thumb. Mm -hmm. before, but it's happening in the operation. So that's the one big efficiency of the bolt action. Now, the deficiencies are early bolt actions. Uh, we'll get more into locking in a second. But mm -hmm. early bolt actions were nowhere near as strong as mm -hmm. a breech block gun. A breech block gun could very naturally be set up to have a lot of reinforcing strength. Yeah. And there's something to be said uh, in a bolt action rifle, about having that bolt come back at your face. Yeah, it was a concern. Um, uh, granted, there's not a lot of guns that really would send a bolt into your face, but I'm sure we can think of a few. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ross rifle. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is a chance of this thing if there's a failure coming back at you, whereas a breech block gun, there tends to be actual metal between you mm -hmm. and the operating action. Yep. Um, realistically, from a military standpoint, breech block guns look almost superior to bolt actions except for maybe the speed mm -hmm. uh, of handling in a lot of ways. And bolt actions may have had some advantages in manufacturing because it's a, it's a tube and you bore it out from the back mm -hmm. and then you set in this bolt that's very sort of self-assemblable and then it just attaches and you're done. Make, yeah. um, and in terms of cleaning a bolt action to me is much easier yeah. because most breech block guns again have yeah, that yeah. metal and yeah. so if you're trying to go down the bore 
Well, in a bolt action, you can pull the bolt out, go from the rear to the front, and blow everything out the front. You're not pushing dirt back into the action. On breech block guns, um, usually you'd want to see something like a pull-through where you could throw the pull-through in and, just, and pull it out the through. front versus a rod. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, they mostly just, at that time, they still were using cleaning rods. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of chance of pushing crap into the action. Yeah, I want that. Um, so we go with a bolt action. We don't want to belabor this point, but you can see where there's some advantages to the bolt action that were not as obvious then that are obvious now. Mm -hmm. We adopt the bolt action. All right. Number one concern of this system, mm. locking strength. Yes. How do we lock our early bolt actions? Usually a lot of times it's kind of the, what we call like the rib, you know, you just have like the one point or the bolt handle sometimes. It's just like wherever it touches the receiver, that's your... That's your locking yeah, surface. Just one locking surface. Uh, a good example of this is like the Chasseau, one of the very early yeah. guns that we tend to think of as uh, a successful bolt action. Yeah. Just locked on the right hand shoulder. Yeah. And granted, with black powder, we're dealing again with not uh, a much shallower pressure curve. So that's really all you need. It's, it works. There's right. No... Yeah. So the one disadvantage of this, though, and we talked about this in our series, yes. is that it's asymmetrical. And yeah, so that's going to drive accuracy problems, especially the older the rifle gets. Yeah, it's, it's a long-term thing. Or I should say thing. precision problems. Right, it's a long-term thing. Is that Yeah, you're putting all the pressure on one side, so over time you're kind of torquing, you're sort of stretching the receiver. On the opposite side. Right. Yeah, so there's some potential problems there. So yeah. that gets solved by symmetrically locking lugs. Yeah, just spread it out evenly and then yeah. you're good. So a good example of this is not necessarily symmetrical, but... Uh, a black powder gun that we talked about was the Ottoman 1887, True. which locked on a rib that was part of the bolt handle. Right. And uh, it's still a lug. It's not just the bolt. We tend to say it locks on the handle. It's a very large uh, yeah. metal rib. It's strong. It's just off center. Right. So uh, Mauser puts on a second Tries to compensate. rib. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal, but it's there. It's getting there. And uh, it's best if they're symmetrical. So a very early symmetrically locking bolt action would be, again, the Vetterly. So the Swiss Vetterly has yeah, two really. locking uh, lugs at the rear. Yep. Um, and we'll talk about rear and front in a second, but they're symmetrical. Mm -hmm. They're very long. Uh, they're very shallow, though. But overall, surface area matters yeah, yeah. more than anything else. Mm -hmm. This is a fairly strong system. Mm -hmm. um, that supports the cartridge evenly, and it adds to accuracy. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, something that they did understand very early is that those locking lugs did not have to be at the rear. They could mm -hmm. be at the front. And if they're at the front, a couple things happen. One, it's much stronger because you have yes. less yeah. distance between what you're resisting and, you know, the, the actual locking action. So the mm -hmm. further you spread that out, it's the more metal there is to compress and yield mm -hmm. and buckle. It's going to want to bend. Closer, better for strength. Mm -hmm. But black powder, not that powerful. So there's not really a strong need to get that close. The bolt can take the beating. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing, though, is if you get closer, again, for the same reasons of weakness, your accuracy goes, or your precision goes up on the gun. I should, I should differentiate between accuracy and precision. If you don't know, accuracy is sort of the ability to hit what you're shooting at, and precision is the ability to hit the same spot over and over again. Mm -hmm. The gun is precise. The man is hopefully accurate. Yeah. Good so way, Good way to look at it. Yeah. So um, the supporting it at the front gives us a much more stable platform for shooting. We get a more accurate shot that way, or a more precise shot. I keep doing that. <laughs> um, but what's the disadvantage here? Why don't we want a front-locking gun way back in the 1870s? Uh, well, because then, well, for one thing, you have to kind of go in there and machine space to, uh, or basically kind of like a ring for the, the lugs to lock into. Which... I, I bet a lot of you had what you thought was the first answer. <laughs> Which is what I tend to think of, which is that black powder fouling is going to be much worse at the front of the bolt than at the rear. But look at the machinist here. Look at, the, look at our animate, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where so my mind goes. So how does he think? He has yeah. to go in there and he has to shape these things. And he can cheat. He can go in in ways that the, the, yeah. the, the smiths then could not. Mm -mm, but. but what does he think of first? And he's not wrong. Because trying to get all the way in there and accurately mill a shape deep into the receiver. It adds complexity. Oh, and on machinery, by the way, fully interchangeable part, fully yes. interchangeable, not yeah, you mostly you have interchangeable to get a, with the little hand fit. They don't come around until we're yeah, practically yeah. on 1900. I mean, they take a while to it, really, it's the American system, by the way. Right. It's a hard or, sell. Yeah. But um, no, the, the idea of having to go through 20,000 rifles and get in there Just and right, turn yeah. out, yeah, you can do it, but, but the amount of tension expensive. and skill, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, that's why even though symmetrically rear locking lugs were known, Mm -hmm. But on Swiss rifles going into the early 1860s, 
1871. Yeah, they were yeah, 1884. Way back. We're yeah. still seeing people adopt right side, single side locking. It works because it's easier. You just yeah. drill out the center, you know, uh, uh, chew out the sides, cut out the middle, like mill out the middle, yeah. and then boom, it drops in. And you can shape it on one dimension. It's not two dimensions to track, mm -hmm. plus another two dimensions on the gun for each lug. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah, I think the one thing I've noticed more than anything is in the, the sort of arms procurement process is if it's more expensive, it's going to be a harder sell to the military. It's like, if it's going to be more expensive because we have to do all these operations, is the benefit, does the benefit outweigh the added cost and complexity of all this machining that we have to do? Because a lot of the times they're going to err on the side of, hey, look, if it works good enough, I'll go with the simpler option. You know? Yeah, uh, it's, it's other people's money to a lot of degree. Or, yeah. you know, in the case of royalty and stuff, you, you still have to tell somebody... Hey, uh, yeah. we gotta spend this much. Ooh. It's not yeah. unlimited. Right. You have to come up with a number that works. Mm -hmm. And so, I really appreciate this is again where I appreciate Bruno's perspective because yeah. I one. might not have even mention the machining difficulties, but he is right. That's... It would have been very hard to do a front locking yeah, lock. That's where my mind goes now. <laughs> yeah, we saw this by the way with Monlicker. Monlicker yes. had had an early front locking gun, and then he abandoned it for a wedge locking, rear locking action. More on that. In mm -hmm. just a moment. Okay, so we now have a way to lock the bolt. Right. Okay. Uh, the other thing that the bolt has to be responsible for, although not always, is controlling the cartridge. Mm -hmm. So uh, it feeds in, it sn snaps down, the cartridge in the chamber, headspace, we talked about all that. Mm -hmm. um, then we fire the thing, we pop her open, and we start to come back. Yes, it looks right. We would hope we would have extractor. So uh, when it comes to your extractor, it's got snap over the rim, be it a uh, full rim or a quote unquote rimless, which actually has a rebated yeah, surface. Yeah, it's kind of a misleading can, term. Yeah. Um, you have to snap over something and right. pull it back, right? right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of earlier guns, it literally was that. You had a, spring, a surface right? and a shape thing, and it was a spring that would Just hit and lip over and come mm -hmm. down, and there'd be a notch in the barrel slash receiver that would allow that to happen, and then you yank it back. Now, what's kind of the problem there? Well, you're depending on the design, you're you're putting kind of stress on the part each time. It's got to right over and snap over, and that's why usually extractors are one of the pieces that most commonly fails or breaks, and then you got to get a new one because it's a spring that's being you know. Yeah. You're doing a lot of repetitive sort of strain injury over a while. Yep. Uh, extracting stuff. And then second to that, and we talked about this repeatedly when we get into the older guns, uh, double feeds. Yes. So if you use a magazine system, which we'll talk about in a moment, but if you use a magazine system and you feed one round almost all the way, but, but you quite. don't yeah. turn down that bolt. If it doesn't snap over, there's no way for the bolt to pull it out. Yeah. If you get in a hurry, you pop it back, you pick up another round, and mm. you immediately ram it into the primer of the first round. Just, then you have out of battery detonation. Yes. Not good. So the gun is no longer, by the way, in battery means closed and locked. Yeah, I'm trying to keep that's this what one you want. Yes, that's what you want. Yeah. And so if it pops and it's not sealed up, all that stuff's coming back at you. Yeah. Because it's going to go, as a matter of fact, more of it's going to come back at you because the case is lighter than the bullet. Right. So the bullet's going to get maybe a little bit up the barrel, mm -hmm. but realistically it's going to stop and all that stuff's coming back at you as a shooter. So uh, you don't want to have a double feed. No. So that introduces the controlled feed, right. which is where the extractor is designed to pick up the rim of the cartridge right from the moment it feeds from the magazine, which does not exist in single shots, so we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Sure. But while we're talking about extraction, a controlled feed is where, as it comes out of the magazine, it's already, boom, under the extractor lip. Yeah, it so, sort of just slides into yep. the extractor. And that means if you partially feed it and then whip it back out, it's going to extract it like normal. Mm -hmm. All right, so the other element of extraction is not just pulling it out of the chamber, there's ejection. So right. what's the difference between an extractor and an ejector? So, well, the name is sort of give it away, but the extractor's job is to for, pull the casing out of the barrel. But the ejector's job is to kick the spent casing out of the action completely so that then you can feed a new one in. Right. And most times ejectors are just simple pieces of solid metal. Yeah, they're probably one of the simpler parts in a yeah. lot of systems. You literally just mill a groove in the bolt and then it yeah. hits the, you know, the ejector rides in that groove and then the back of the casing hits it and it just, yeah. the extractor is holding it, let's say, on the right side. Yeah. It's the ejector usually, hits yeah. it on the left. They're almost always opposite usually, the yeah. extractor. Or at least offset from each other. Yeah. Right. So then if it extracts topwards, the ejector is bottomwards. Yeah, it just kicks it up or kicks Sometimes it Sometimes you see a bottom ejector and a right side extractor, so it kicks it out in a way this way. Mm -hmm. But same idea. Now, the problem with milling into the bolt body to make a path for a permanent ejector is that you weaken the bolt. Right. So a lot of countries opted for things like tipping ejectors or ejectors that somehow stay out of the way yeah. until the last possible second. So 
um, you see a lot of split lug bolts. So you have a locking lug that's actually cut in half in a yeah, way. Yeah. That introduces potential weakness to the system. Mm -hmm. um, so then you see guns that try to get around it by having like a little ejector that's like a little capsule. Yeah, a little button, yeah. And then, uh, mm -hmm. then there's a part that hits that at the last second that then pokes out the cartridge. That adds a level of complexity. Yeah. Um, mostly we sure later see with Mauser 98s and stuff, we see a sort of last minute shape to allow a spring-loaded ejector to get in there at the last second. Yeah, yeah. it just slides in. And, then yeah. it and so what they do is they'll tend to split the locking lug in front of the locking surface. So the locking surface itself is solid, mm -hmm. and then it can just pass in front and kick it out, yeah. common in their Arisakas and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got all those ejectors going. Um, a lot of times they're tied in with what's known as a bolt stop because when we start to pull that bolt out of the action, something's got to halt it. Otherwise, yeah, it would just come out of the gun. Yeah. <laughs> now, this doesn't seem like the hardest technology in the world. A bolt stop is just a piece of metal that has to be at the mm. rear that keeps yeah. it from coming back. On the right. Mauser 71, we saw it was just a ring. Just, yeah. just a, a screw ring a with a screw. Yeah. yeah. That's all you need. Um, but can you think of any nefarious bolt stops? Bolt stops that have caused problems for not being designed correctly. Well, we... <laughs> We sort of uh, maybe alluded to it earlier, but the Ross, I think, is maybe an example of, of a bolt stop that could be problematic in that it was deforming sort of bolt heads or things like that. Yeah, that is an excellent example because uh, this is interesting. This is very unique to the Ross, but essentially the Ross had an interrupted screw style locking lug. Mm -hmm. So it's a bunch of little triangles. Yep. And then at the depth of the cutouts for each triangle, well, you got to go past that depth with your bolt stop. Or else, nice. when you come back, you're going to deform, like, the, the first triangle. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the best way I could describe it, is the first triangle has to kind of... Yeah. If we're down here, we're not influencing the first triangle. But if, but if we're back if here... If it's not deep enough, yeah. yeah you're, so, you're by the way, we turn the bolt in the battery, all those little triangles lock in, all of the mad strength, which is why the Ross has a very strong locking action, because all that surface area gets added the in more there. more surface area, the better. Yeah. Um, but... You come back, and on the bolt stop they screwed up, the bolt stop only impacts the left side rear triangle. So if it doesn't go to the root, that little triangle takes all of the weight, and it did, and it deformed. Yeah. So a bolt stop seems like a nothing part, and I'm sure when they were doing the Ross, they were like, eh, hey, just throw a bolt stop in there. Yeah, whatever, yeah. They didn't think about it. Yeah, it, But it's critical. Especially when you're operating a rifle, like, when you... If you're yanking it back, the bolt stop is what's stopping the bolt. It's yeah. absorbing all that force, so over time... You know, it'll start to kind of shave away. I've seen like uh, I think Springfield 1903 comes to mind, where it's like uh, it's also the it serves multiple functions. But you, like I told when I took it apart, I was just like, oh man, like you can see it's like it's bent, at, like there's like a bevel from like just the bolt yeah, smacking it over and over. So which by the way is almost the same bolt stop as a Ross. So yeah, again, not it's... the best design necessarily. Yeah, but um, bolt stop counts. Uh, mm. Don't dismiss the little stuff. Mm. And, you know, people say, "Well, I care if the bolt stops different." It's like, well, you might. Yeah. It might be what stops your gun from running. Yeah, or even just from an, a, a maintenance standpoint, like the, how you design it in terms. You've got to like take the bolt out because you're cleaning the rifle. You know, the less annoying you make that to do, there's also a good thing. Oh yeah, look at the label. Out. Trying to get a label apart. Yeah. Um, and speaking of which, I guess that kind of sets us up uh, when we're in battery, when we're getting ready to fire. Mm. Um, do we have a, a bolt face milled into the bolt body? Or do we have a separate bolt head? So, uh, you know, mechanically, simply, just having like a tube with a face on the end, like a closed end tube, like an elongated cup. Right. Easy to make, mechanically. Yeah, simpler, yeah. Sure. Um, simpler design, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, kind of harder to produce than that if you want to have locking lugs on the bolt body as well. Yeah, okay, yeah, we're getting you, some weird territory yeah. in terms of milling. Yeah, you need... But you know, um, in order to have a bolt head, it gives us a couple of advantages. One, interchangeable bolt heads mean that we can adjust for headspace. This is very famously done yes. on the number four series of Lee Enfields. Mm -hmm. And then number two, having a separate bolt face adds strength uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that we can now harden up this one component. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, soft, yeah. yep, we have, uh, especially if the locking lugs are with the bolt head, right. then boy, you can get away from wild stuff. Like mm -hmm. if you have a bolt head that is hardened steel with front locking lugs, and it's carrying the locking lugs, you can practically make the bolt body out of iron. Not that somebody would, because yeah, there's other problems that come with that. But, but, you know, you really concentrate all that locking strength into one place, mm -hmm. which is really good. But there's other guns that, by the way, have separate bolt heads that still lock at the rear, that still lock elsewhere off the bolt head. Mm -hmm. And they still get some strength advantages because they're just not putting all that weight into the bolt body every single time. It's being absorbed by a separate part that is possibly interchangeable if it walks out of head space yes. and things like that. Um you also have to decide if you want a rotating or non-rotating bolt head. 
Is yeah. he just, just like is it just going to rotate against the back of the cartridge when it falls into place, or is it going to stay stable while the rest of the stuff turns around it? Right. There's some advantages there. Um, we're not trying to turn a cartridge that has this. This really helps on extraction yes. because if your bolt head will stay, if your bolt head will stay still, uh, once you fired it and that brass has swelled and grabbed every possible bit of sand mm -hmm. and grit and everything in there, and you want to yank it back out, yeah. well. You really want to do as little as possible with that surface area engaged. Mm -hmm. So if you try to roll it, you're trying to drag all that surface area and then drag all that surface area out versus yeah. just going ahead and yanking that surface area. Yeah, out. it gives you a little more purchase and makes the, the process a bit smoother. Yep. Uh, there's also some choices on extractor in the same sense. Do we want an extractor that rotates with it or not? Mm -hmm. um, there can be some advantage to the extractor sort of like getting a finger in there and lipping over. Yes. It's not great. It's not a huge advantage. Because generally extractors want to rely on having a nice yank. Right. Uh, but we do get what's called um, primary extraction. Right. So as we open the bolt, if we have a beveled surface that allows the bolt to, as it's being rotated horizontally, like we're, we're putting linear force, we're rotating this bolt. If we create a system that causes it to cam backwards a little bit as we rotate it, that gives us what's known as primary extraction force, which means that our rotational motion is being converted into linear torque, which is just putting extra pounds on getting that cartridge, that casing, just the spent casing, I'm moving I'm just a little it. bit, just yep. a little put. That's the hardest part, yeah. Yep. So our extractor can go over the case rim while it's doing that, but generally if it holds still and gets really dug in there, that gives us a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, if it does rotate with it, the other thing we have to do is we have to mill a metal path Right. all the way around that rim and so that weakens up and also partially unsupports the rear of the case yes. so if we just have a linear extractor that doesn't rotate or is part of a bolt head that doesn't rotate or whatever mm -hmm. um then we only have to cut out the little one notch yeah, and we don't weaken stronger. the whole chamber area right at the back edge which is exactly where you don't really want to weaken it so the advantage is there to non-rotating and rotating. Um, just stuff you wouldn't think of that goes into designing one of these guns. It's a lot of minutia. Um, and while we're talking about extractors, I didn't even say this before, uh, the Mauser 98 is a really good example mm -hmm. of a very complicated extractor system because it has like a reverse bevel so that the harder you pull against the front of that thing, the more it tucks in and ratchets. So it's yeah. being held tighter to the bolt body. But then if you punch forward on something, like let's say it wants to snap over a case that got stuck or you thumb one in the action and you pump forward, well, you don't want that, that overt yeah, tightness you to be a problem. It. So when you push at the front of that thing and it's bevel, it naturally wants to spring away. So it very naturally gets out of the way. And then, and then once it's hooked yeah. in, it really wants to torque down whenever you pull rearward. Brilliant design. It, lots yeah. of little finesse that goes into just the extractor alone. Mm -hmm. So And that took them like a decade of just continuous improvement to get where yeah. you wanted it to be. Yeah. yeah, just one little change in terms of dimensions. By the way, this is something that's on the Mauser 98 that I don't think got passed to the Arasaka. And it's a good advantage mm -hmm. that I don't think they took advantage of. They might not even noticed it when they were looking at the gun. Yeah, so, I mean, I would have included it. It's a brilliant yeah, it's, extractor. I, it's probably one of my favorite designs. Yeah. And that's that's in addition to the fact that it's just a full-length extractor that has lots say, of yield. It's, it's a massive extractor, yeah, a lot of surface yeah. area. For and that, that was an attempt to get rid of, again, like you said... The most easily failed part in the system. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, if you if you can avoid that from breaking, that's you're doing good. So again, all hail the Mauser extractor. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's one major component of the whole action <laughs> that we haven't even talked about yet because we're we're deep into this. Yeah, we, yeah. You, there's a lot of stuff to cover. Yeah, caulking basically. It's, it's pretty important step. Although technically speaking, not necessary. Yeah. Uh, look at like, like again the Chaspo that we've referenced before. It yeah. did not have initially. No, any sort of self-cocking system, mm -mm. you you had you to just, cock it, just, open the bolt, yeah. put around it, close it, fire it, cock it, open the bolt. Yeah, it's the operator had to do the stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, but mechanically, we can work a cocking operation into a bolt action. It's not required, yes. but we can, and yeah, most and pretty much everybody do. Yeah. So, um, what are our two types of cocking that we really? Yeah. Make so up? the one you hear all the time is either cocking when you open the rifle, or when you open the bolt, or and cocking on close rather when you're bolting down. And basically, when are you tensioning the spring, basically? Yeah. You know what? I'm, we're doing a disservice. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be a 101. We haven't even defined what cocking is. That's a good point. Yeah. So we talked about we have a center fire. In this case, center fire. It could be rim fire. Uh, we have a center fire primer. Mm -hmm. We have a firing pin. Right. And it's essentially almost all bolt actions are striker fire. There's like Remington Keen kind of There's exception. some weird stuff that's, yeah. yeah but but um, we have a firing pin that's just sitting there waiting. 
All right. There's a spring that's... And there's yeah. a spring pushing it forward. It wants to go and hit that. This is probably a great visual. Uh, <laughs> it wants to yeah. go forward, and it's being held back, actually, by, by a notch, usually. Yep. And that notch is engaged on what's known as the sear. We'll get there when we talk about triggers yep. in a second. So yep. the sear is holding it back. Then when we pull the trigger, we'll, we'll it releases that, and boom. it just goes boom. Yeah. Okay. It, it doesn't travel very far, but it hits yeah. pretty so hard. Boom, and it hits the primer, and it sets off the gun, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, cocking is the act of taking this from the forward position where it's touching that primer, right. and, and we need to withdraw it so that it can be ready to do it again. Right. you got to retension it, yeah. Yeah. So we can tension it in two potential places. Mm -hmm. So we can, uh, and by the way, almost all bolt actions, and we think of the modern sense, do have sort of what you would think of as a rebound position where yes. even if they're what we call cock on close, almost all of them, when you open the action, there's a minor camming operation yes. in which the rotational yeah, force just is turned into linear force. And what it's especially doing is because if you imagine this is the bolt head and we've stuck the firing pin through it in order to hit the primer, I'm over-exaggerating. But when we start to retract it, we want to get it just far enough back that we're not going to have an out-of-battery detonation. What we don't want to do is try yeah. to ram a bolt forward with a pin still sticking out. Because then as soon as, yeah, it hits Is there any resistance? Or you have a rim lock. Let's say you get a rim lock and it just like holds it just enough to punch that firing pin and bleh. No, no, no. So all of them to some degree yes. cock a little a bit safety, on open. Yeah, yeah, if nothing has a safety measure. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, so it cocks back means that we no longer have the, we get a, let's get a safety margin, but we haven't put a whole ton of pressure in this. We put, no, just a you know, a couple ounces at maybe not even that mm -hmm. to get it to the safe margin. But realistically, the spring tension that's on this thing is pretty severe. Yes. So we have to put, let's say, a pound of force. I don't know what to call it. It depends on the gun. Yeah, some amount of force. But too. a significant amount of force has to go into cocking the spring. Mm -hmm. When do we want to take that force on our hand? Mm -hmm. So we have two options, cock on open and cock on close. Yes. So cock on open, uh, actually cock on close is probably the simplest. How does that work? Yeah, so there basically you're you're not you're putting the full tension when you're pushing the bolt back forward mm -hmm. and locking it down. Basically, the we mentioned this here briefly earlier, yeah. but it'll basically grab on like the it'll grab on and then you keep pushing the bolt forward and you lock it down. Right, and then you're fully tensioned. So as you run the bolt forward, eventually the firing pin catches that sear. And then you keep running the bolt yeah, forward, yeah. but at the moment this happens, you're going to notice some pressure starting to build. Yep. And by the time you close it, a lot of pressure is built. Mm -hmm. And so you're fighting the spring as you, so you're holding one way with your forearm with the right. gun mm -hmm. and you're shoving with your hand and, and you're gets, compressing the a spring. Point where, yeah, whoop, yep. So this is famously used on the Lee Enfield. Lee Enfield, also Mauser 89 as well. Yep. There's a few other designs, yep. Um, there's a number of designs. The, I mean, even like the Arasaka is predominantly yes. cock on. There's a little bit of cock on open going on, yeah. but three two thirds of it is cock on close. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, there are hybrid systems. That yes, yeah, yeah. Arasaka has, a, one or the other, Arasaka yeah. has a, maybe like a quarter to a third cock on open. Like a little bit of that action happens and then not just the safety, but a little extra. Yeah. And then you bolt it back forward and yeah. most of it's cock on close. So, What's the problem with cock on close? Is that as we're holding this thing, we're shoving forward, we're pushing the muzzle down, we're fighting it, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's things like Lee Enfields where they have fairly light springs, not that bad. But there's other guns that have heavier springs be, due to their yeah. design. It kind of hurts. Yeah, especially if also if you're not used to it or you're used to cock on open guns, you have to like, sometimes you might not put it into battery all the way where you're like, oh, wait, I got to put a bit more force into it. Yep. Um, it tends to mess with people. New shooters especially mm. seem to have problems with cock on closes if they're mm -hmm. not very lightly sprung like the Lee Enfield. Yes. Um, I've definitely noticed that. Like, mm -hmm. people just, is this right? And they're just... Huh. Yeah, yeah, it feels weird. Yeah, because yeah, they know it's weird, but the doubt is on the closing stroke. Right. Because a live round's going in. Now, if you have something that's stuck on a cock on open, they usually are just like, this is stuck. And they just, they know it's stuck and they know it needs to open. Like, mm -hmm. then nothing feels wrong other than it's just stuck. Right. So, um, but you're pushing down and away from yourself. You're pushing it up off your shoulder. If you're yes. getting into a rapid fire situation, there's a chance that you're getting up off your shoulder yeah, and then happen. bang, and you don't have a good... Same thing with we were talking about headspace. It's mm -hmm. the same thing on your shoulder with the buttstock. Yeah, it's going to hurt. Um, and also, people have problems with pushing the rifle down and away right before they're ready to shoot versus when they're already disturbing their aim for having to... Because you have to think about it this way. I shoot the gun... Now i got to open it. That's going to disturb my aim on a bolt-action rifle. Right. So, boom, I'm disturbing my aim. As I start to close it, I should be reacquiring my aim. But if I'm fighting this spring, yeah, there's more as, my, as my sight picture's coming back into back. view, I'm still fighting the gun. Right. Whereas if it were now the option is cock on open. So how does right. cock on open work? So with cock on open, you have uh, a wedge, basically, on the bolt body. And on the opening, when you open, you rotate 90 degrees to open the bolt. 
that cams back and retensions the spring all in one go. Yep. So it cams the caulking piece back, and then that's enough for it to, like, there's usually a divot or something. Yeah, there's a little cutout usually for the, the and, thing to By the way, on. similarly, how most caulk on closed actions still have a little bit of caulk on open because they don't want that, that yes. firing pin sticking out. There's a little bit of caulk on close on every caulk on open yes. because even though it holds that sear to the rear, there needs to be some clearance so that it can yeah, the sear can align. Yeah. So you'll tend to get in there and turn the bolt it's down, and then a yet. little bit of tension would come forward, yep. and maybe you're, maybe it's a little bit in your hand, but you don't. It's it's not yeah, a lot. It's not so. very perceptible. Yeah. So all the energy is expended on the opening, opening stroke, stroke, and yeah. that's all through torque. So yeah, just, you, the idea is that you're getting a mechanical assist. Number one. And then number two, it's that you've already shot, now you're disturbing your aim anyway, so let's mm -hmm. just put it here. Yeah. And then the thought process is you're drawing that pressure into yourself. Like it's coming, especially mm -hmm. if you're right-handed, which they assumed everybody was. Pretty much. Because left-handedness was the devil's work. Yes. Um, so you, you just crank that open, mm -hmm. and it's being brought into your chest. This right. is where all your strength is. Yeah, you're pulling into shorter, yourself. Yeah, a, yeah. Um, so then pop back forward nice and light and down so as you're coming forward and down you can just go ahead and acquire your target and it's, it's nice stable. and easy and also kind of was saying where people get kind of confused with the the cock on closer they're like am i pushing it enough or with this there's a hard stop because you hit the wall of the receiver yeah. so you know okay that i'm good and then you can yank back there's no there's less doubt i think in yeah. terms of now of course this can go poorly if it's not configured correctly uh, a very famous gun for this is the mosin yeah. we talked about this yeah, and there's been some controversy but the mosin has gritty yeah <sighs> There's a lot of looseness in the Mosin yes. on the parts that don't need to be it loose. It feels wrong, but you're like, no, everyone's just like, no, 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 that's the way they are. And you're like, okay. There's, there's too much room for flex in there. Yeah. There's some elasticity that you feel. Don't and when you don't something. have a rigid cock on, by the way, a perfectly tight, beautiful cock on open is amazing. Like oh, uh, yeah. Car 88. Yeah, if, if it's, so if it's set up just right, yeah. You but the Mosin, I mean, you gotta, you gotta, yeah, you gotta whack it sometimes. It doesn't want to go all the way. And again, elasticity in the bolt. So the thing mm -hmm. is, if you design the system like the Mosin, where it's got sort of this looseness in it for cock on close, you wouldn't really notice. No, it, it will work the way it works. Yeah. There's, there's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. But if you're not going for precision, uh, cock on open, maybe not the best way to go. Mm -hmm. So somebody should develop a cock on close Mosin. It'll go a lot better. All right, Bruno, to me, a good cock on open is better than a cock on close. I know some people would argue with that, but no, as, as a person, I feel like, regardless of what goes into it, mm -hmm. the sensation of a good cock on open versus a good cock on close, it just feels, yeah. a good cock on open is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, mechanically, why should we not want that? It does, again, add a bit of complexity uh, in terms of manufacturing. And I'll tell you from personal experience, having to <laughs> having to model that, that wedge and that, that oh man, I, I, I've spent hours, let's put it that way, on just getting it so that it lines up just right. And also, it's a very peculiar shape. It's very precise uh, for it to cam properly. So again, that can add to cost and complexity and manufacturing time. Yeah, and in addition, if there's any futs and mutts that gets in there, yep. yeah. like you we saw this, Ian did a, a Mosin mud test. Yep. And yeah. they had a failure of the Mosin system, mostly because of the cock on open operation. Mm -hmm. uh, if it had been a cock on closed gun, I don't think it would have tied up quite the same way because I, I suspect that where it broke down at was in that camming yeah, surface. There's a lot, yeah, that, that, yeah, if you get any 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 crap in there, yeah. it's not going to like it. So uh, this leads us to saying that you know, you got to shroud the actions, you got to seal those actions better. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk more about this when we get over to like split bridge versus solid bridge too. That, that has a big factor to it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know... In general, cock and close is a bit simpler to produce. Yes. Um, uh, definitely uh, less susceptible to dirt and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so this is why, by the way, Lee Enfield gets a good rep because mm -hmm. rear locking lugs even later on and cock on close makes it very resistant yes. to fouling. It's a nice side effect, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, also easier machining in a lot of ways. Yep. Like, and I would argue once you get used to it, you can get pretty good with it and pretty quick with it. Yeah. So. Uh, and by the way, again, we're leaving tons of stuff out. Oh, God, we're, yeah. We're it's, getting, it, this is a very... It hurts me a little bit. I'm already yes. thinking of stuff like when we <laughs> talked about the barrels, we didn't go into heavy oh, barrels. We yeah. didn't go into... There's all sorts of stuff yes. that you guys are probably screaming at your monitors. By all means, go nuts in the comments. Talk to each other. Talk to everybody. There's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of viewers on this. Mm -hmm. So um, we covered all that. Uh, when we get down to the bolt action, we're getting down to some, some sort of last minute stuff. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, another thing to think of that a lot of people don't think about, um, out of battery, mm. uh, prevention of the caulking piece rotating. So yes. if the caulking piece comes back and it gets twisted while it's out of battery, it, it no longer lines up with the keyway in mm -hmm. the receiver. Okay, yeah. You try to bolt it forward and it ties up the whole action. It's mm -hmm. a big mess. 
Um, there is one gun that we've covered in the series that does not have an out of battery prevention system or out of battery rotation lock. Um, that would be the Vigero. So you can bolt mm. back a Vigero yes. and spin the cogging piece and just pump it forward and it's all jammed up. Mm-hmm. It's not a very likely thing to happen, but still pain in the butt. And most mechanisms to prevent this are very, very simple. Um, in the case of Mauser 98, it's actually very complex. It actually has a, a yes. detent and a spring. and It's, it's, it's very German. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, <laughs> but in most cases, it's just like a, a very positive notch, mm-hmm. which again goes in that a lot of cock on opens have a little bit of cock on close. A lot of that is being able to set in that notch and prevent it from rotating out of battery, mm-hmm. uh, like we would see on like the Gewehr 88s and stuff. Yeah. Also, if you're taking them apart, because I've definitely, uh, I've definitely had some <laughs> on the job injuries when yeah, you, you, uh, cocking piece slips and you, you oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you take the bolt out of the gun, and then you're you're fiddling with it, and uh, it just like you say so you want to clean it or something, and it just sort of snaps down. Yeah. The other thing is you have to manually recock that, and on some guns it's easy. Yeah, you, but you don't. But you don't. Have, yeah, when you don't have the mechanical advantage of. Well, so like a Mauser ninety eight, <sighs> terrible. Oh god, you've got yeah, a, it's, it's got a shroud, so you can't get a hold of the yeah, cocking no piece itself. It's shrouded, so you got to get some sort of flat surface under the where the yeah, steer would engage on the notch. And then you got to hope that you don't like yep. let loose and it goes flying. Yeah, By the way, this counts. It counts for yeah, being field yeah. service. Yeah, if you got a field strip, you got to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it can wear on you. Yeah. So, I mean, even little details like that. Now, of course, there is one thing we haven't spoken about at all when we're talking about straight pull, or when we're talking about bolt actions. And I just gave it away <laughs> for straight pulls. Sorry, yeah, trying yeah, to organize weird, myself. Yeah. So, um, there exception. are bolt actions that sort of break a lot of the rules. Yes. Because they're straight pull rifles. Right. Almost everything we've said applies so far, though. Yeah, a lot of the things are universal. Yeah, I mean, it's it, the only difference for a straight pull and a bolt action is that somehow. The straight pull takes that linear force of pulling that bolt back mm. and turns it into some sort of rotational force. Yeah. Most like K31 that we think of or uh, Ross rifle. Or, uh, 1895 1895 Monlicker. Mm-hmm. They have bolt heads that rotate. And there's a camming track that kind of, yeah. There is at least one. Can you think of one that doesn't have a rotating bolt head? It just escaped me, but yeah. Monlicker 1886. Yes, it's just got a wedge. In the 88s. Yeah. They still are rotating force, though, because the wedge yes. rotates down and yeah, rotates can, up. I guess you could call it a pivot, but yeah. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. true. But again, yeah, pivoting semantics. force, rotating force. Mm-hmm. And what it is, is we've translated a pull at the mm-hmm. rear into this flipping motion or into this rotating motion. And so that's how the gun locks and works and locks yeah. up. Now, um, in terms of bolt actions, the only thing this really adds is speed. Um, yes. yeah. The mechanical operation of lifting your arm 90 degrees... And pulling it back. It, it gets in the way. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, there are non 90 degree rotating bolt actions. Yes, there are. Uh, I think the crag is among them. Um, yes. There's, oh God, I'm trying to think of some other examples now. I want to say the Liam field, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I it's wanna... slightly off. Yeah, it's but not. Right. But it's still symmetrical locking. Let's not go yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I still think it's technically a 90 degree sweep, but the handle comes down. Sure. Yeah. That's um, I'm trying to think. There's another. I, I want to say the. Oh, God, there's I'm not that many, but yeah. There's a there's few. A few. Um, as a matter of fact, there's some early guns that use what would have been the locking action for the AR-15 later, where it's a spline lug. Yes. Which is lots of little lugs, so that all it has to do is rotate 20 it degrees. Have to rotate as far, so you just yeah. dick, and you come back and dick. So realistically, mm-hmm. I mean, you could have a bolt, and there have been bolt actions that you turn them less than 20 degrees, and they unlock, and they, unlock and mm-hmm. they come back. So you can, you can reduce the time it takes to operate a bolt action that rotates, mm-hmm. But in this case, the linear pull, straight pull rifles, they want to take all that out so that you, oh, yeah. the soldier, just have one yes, hand motion, linear motion versus yeah. two. Because it's two, it's yeah. two motions. Up, back. Yes. And there is a slight... There is a it's bit, minor, but there, I mean, you can get it into a nice smooth flow. But, but it's, it's technically two operations. Right. Yes. And mm-hmm. so just whick, boom, whick, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, whick, whick, boom, whick, whick, boom, whick, whick, boom. Um, cool. One of the problems I have with straight pulls we'll talk about in a moment is positioning of the bolt handle. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so straight pulls, supposed to be a little faster, uh, simpler to operate, much more complex in terms of Oh, God, yeah. I, I'm getting flashbacks to making that 1895. That was not fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'll be happy for the K31 as well. Oh, yeah, that'll be great. That'll be great. Um, they're ve- they require much more precise manufacturing yes. in a lot of ways because now... You have to have, you know, in a, in a traditional, we think like a Mauser 98. Mm-hmm. It's nice that it fits well and it feels good that it fits well. But realistically, actually, let's talk about the Carcano. Carcano mm-hmm. rattles the bolt everywhere. Oh, yeah, it's sloppy, and it's but, sloppy and it's but, not. But it, it works, works yeah, because all you need to be accurate on or precise on in the manufacturing, I keep doing that today, <laughs> um, is the locking lugs have mm-hmm. to fit into the recesses nice in the receiver slash barrel. That all has to line up. Yes. 
That's it. The rest of it can be floppy, yeah, okay. sloppy. It doesn't feel great, but who cares? It, yeah, just, it works. Work. Yeah. So with a straight pull, though, in order for it to operate appropriately, a lot of the parts have to cam together yeah, accurately as you're operating. The tolerances are much tighter. Yep. yep. Okay. So brief. There's we can go way down the, the straight mm. pull road. I'm yeah. not going to do that. But um, bolt handle depositing. Mm. So uh, our gun here is a good example of that. I'm actually going to finally pick this guy up. All right. <laughs> uh, we're going to see some receivers in a moment, but the short answer is notice that this bolt handle on the bolt stops right by the trigger. Um, I can think of better guns like the 1917 Enfield yes, or P14. Yeah, kind of dog leg. Yeah, yeah. dog leg bolt. Those are those wacky bolts are actually there's quite a, brilliant. There's a reason. Because yeah. the idea is I'm here and I'm shooting, and then this is very specific to magazine rifles. Nobody seemed to care about this until magazine rifles. Yep. But I'm here, and then I want to work this action load it back, drop her down, and then I gotta go find the trigger. Well, if this bolt handle takes me right to the trigger, it's less travel. this is a little fit forward. I gotta come back and down. Mm -hmm. But some guns will put me whoof, yes. right on the trigger. Lee it's Enfield a, is known for this. It's an ergonomics thing. Yep. yep. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, Lee Enfield's known for this. It's just faster fire rate. Okay. Just the ability for the shooter to more comfortably get off a shot with less fiddling and hand motion. You know, it's a long departure, but what it is, is this is, you said it, human ergonomics. Yeah, it's just figuring that out. It's just what works for the human body to get where it needs to go as efficiently as possible. And it's being worked out in ways on these guns that are actually, frankly, surprising. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, it just requires a lot of testing because, you know, you'll start manipulating it, you'll give some of the field trials, and they'll come back and be like, well, you know, it'd be nice if the bull handle was a little further back, or maybe, like, this wrist angle is not quite, you know, it's just, it's hard to sort of think of all those things ahead of time, and then you just yeah. gotta experiment. And by the way, there's disadvantages to this. If this one with the turned down bolt gets tied up, if it gets stuck or yeah, locked down or something, you gotta get your hand under that bolt. And depending on the gun, you have there's a less not a lot of room. Area. Yeah, yeah, and if it's there. really flush, like a spoon handle on a Car 88, yeah. you can't even whack it against a rock if you yeah. need to. But look at the Mosin. The Mosin, bolt handle sticks straight Boom. out to the right. Yeah, you can just... And honest to God, can... it should be four feet long for how this thing <laughs> Yeah, it gives some more leverage. The <laughs> longer, more sticky outy bolt handles give you more leverage to open a stuck action. Mm -hmm. But the disadvantage is they don't put you anywhere near the trigger. And no. if you're carrying it around... They get in, they get in the way. Yeah, yeah, they poke and pop and they get hung up on stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a choice there too in yeah. terms of ergonomics versus torque. Yeah. All right, so uh, that covers the action. Let's get into the next little bit. All right, Bruno, the receiver. This is the, well, this is the sort of skeleton of everything. I don't, I'm trying to think of a, a parallel for well, people who aren't used to this. It's like the case, but for the rifle. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is the heart of basically what lets the action settle in mm -hmm. and serves as everything that is not the barrel and the magazine. If yeah. it's a magazine repeater. I sure. mean, it's, yeah. if you think of a very traditional firearm, it would be a barrel mounted to a block of metal of some sort that mm -hmm. acted as the breech system. Mm -hmm. And so th it's what receives the barrel. It receives the bolt in this case. Yeah, it ties everything together. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay. And then this is the traditional sense. In mm -hmm. U.S. legislation, lots of things have sort of gotten weirder. Uh, yeah, it gets Like the modular AR platform they tend to call the lower portion the receiver because uh, it contains yeah. the trigger group. It gets weird, yeah. Because at that time there was an obsession with sears because sears is how you would control automatic fire in that system. Mm -hmm. But realistically, actually, when we think of it in a historical context, you'd almost imagine the upper section of an AR-15 would be what we would consider the receiver. Because right. okay. it has the bolts the, and the locking and system and the, the barrel pressure. and, yep. you know, it's all the, it's everything but the trigger group. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, traditionally, the trigger group is contained within the receiver along with the bolt and the attachment to the barrel is happening at the right. receiver. So we have receivers. And these can be fairly boring or fairly ornate. Yeah. Um, in the God knows, yeah. simplest sense in the era that we're talking about, we tend to think of them in two categories. Mm -hmm. Did you want to cover those? Yeah, sure. So basically, it's either what's called a split bridge, or I guess, uh, I'm not sure what the other one's called, actually. I guess a whole bridge or... A yeah, just a solid, solid receiver. receiver. Yeah. yeah. And so a split bridge receiver uh, is a lot of what we think of in terms of the earliest bolt-action rifles, like the Chasse Po, right. the Mauser 71. These are guns that have open tops that allow the bolt handle to pass through mm -hmm. the back section of the receiver and then turn down at the middle point. Yes. And what that did is it allowed the bolt handle root, that sort of lug around the bolt handle, to, be, yeah. to act as the locking surface. Yeah, it's got to have a path to go back and forth. Yeah. Now, all of this comes from the fact that the bolt-action rifle is inspired by literally that little lock that goes on your door, that little 
tab uh, that yeah. just turns and turns down. It was a way to have something not move linearly. And at some point, an arms designer saw that and went, oh, man, that would work. That, that would just keep it back. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same system. It has to pass through and turn down. Right. Well, this introduces potential weakness because the back end of the receiver is supported at the bottom and tied together, but, but at the top it's not. It's just kind of flex open, yeah. there. And then like we said with the bolt handle position issue, going through the receiver and turning down puts the bolt handle well ahead of the trigger. So you have to like drop it in and then find the trigger again every time. Mm -hmm. So we start to see solid bridged receivers, yeah. mostly because the bolt handle is no longer being passed through and turned down. Instead, locking lugs have taken on that role. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a really early example of this actually would be again the Swiss Vetterli. Yeah, there was that gun was ahead of its time in a lot of ways. Oh yeah, so that, that nice. gun used locking lugs at the rear, bolt handle all the way at the rear, and mm -hmm. it put your hand right by the trigger. So that is a beautiful system. Yeah, turned down as well. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, you love the Lee Enfield. Well, I guess you love the Swiss Vetterli because that's where that handle cool. turned into. Kind of I mean, heavy though. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. So <laughs> that's the thing beside the point. I know. So. Um, so we have a, a, a bolt handle all the way at the rear. Um, that allows us to have a receiver bridge mm -hmm. in this case, which is the piece of metal that is sort of... The problem is you have to have a way for cartridges to sort of get in and out of the receiver, so that creates this cavity you gotta have that, in yeah. the middle point. Yeah. So uh, there, you can have some metal overarching at the rear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, famously, the Lee Enfield is one of those guns that had a bolt handle that did not have to go through but still had a split bridge mm -hmm. but uh they would go back and they'd put a clip bridge on it yes. so this was a way to load the magazine we'll talk more about that in a moment mm -hmm. but when you have a receiver bridge you also have the chance to shape a gap in there to allow a loading accessory of some sort usually a stripper, stripper clip, clip yeah. to line up and then be held in place mm -hmm. until it can be Something used. Mm -hmm. So solid bridge guns tend to be preferred for strength. Yeah, yeah, you get some cross strength yep. holding it together. And for loading, yep. but a uh, slight disadvantage for manufacturer because you, yeah. you have to do all your milling from the rear. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can kind of come in from the side to get certain shapes, yeah, but you're but... not really going to make a 90 degree turn yeah. versus just going down there to broach out those like lugways, raceways. Yeah, the raceways, yeah. yeah. There's more operations. Yeah. So um, split bridge, probably a little easier. Probably why the original Lee Enfields, despite not needing, needing to, person, it was probably, probably had a broaching operation yeah. that came through the center. Um, yeah. So there's some difference there. And realistically, that's almost all the differences in the receivers. Now, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. shaping-wise, there's some differences. We'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, I will point out there's one really wild thing. Um, the Japanese had a naval rifle mm. at the end of the war yes. in which the locking lugs were not in the receiver. They were in the barrel because then they could make the barrel and the bolt out of hardened steel and they could make the receiver out of a much softer oh, metal wow. because all the locking action was happening between the bolt and barrel absorb. directly. Yeah. Anyway. And so it's, there's always ex exceptions to everything. Yeah, so while the locking lugs are generally thought of as being part of the receiver, the locking action tends they to be part of the receiver. They have to be, yeah. They have to be. In theory, you can have a receiverless gun i don't know how but it wouldn't almost be, yeah. receive like you can get really skeletonized on a receiver yes um the, certainly the japanese figured out a way to take all the locking strength out of the receiver mm -hmm. honestly quite brilliant mm -hmm. um so yeah th again this is high level stuff there's all sorts of details now uh generally receivers are mostly tube shaped because that's easier to mill yeah, out you just get a stock mill yeah. it out and you yeah. go out the center and you know you have stock steel that comes in a rod yeah so it's easy to yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the decisions in terms of receiver production had to do with steel same with barrel um mm -hmm. i'd say 90 percent of any barrel or receiver is just in the selection of steel metallurgy yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh so that's really where the variations come into play mm -hmm. um if you have poor quality steel you might need a beefier receiver if you got better quality steel you can get you can it pretty get... slim mm -hmm. um there's a lot of shaping and contour that can go into receiver um there is really wacky stuff like the pattern 14 okay. where it has this massive built up rear receiver yes. with sight protectors so that you can have that aperture sight that comes all the way back to your eye we'll talk about that in a second mm. so there's some variation there but generally it's actually a very simple concept the good old receiver mm. all right bruno what do you think the card said uh, triggers, probably. Yeah. And how many types do we really consider in terms of military rifles? Really just two, the single or the double-stage trigger. Yeah, the two-stage trigger or the any bitty any wee first stage. One, yeah. So here's the idea. We pull the trigger, 
Mm-hmm. The trigger operates the sear. Either directly, it can be just a part of the trigger, just holding it, yeah. or a separate piece that has its own spring. Mm-hmm. Um, the trigger can have its own spring. It can also be powered by a sear spring. Like there's all sorts there's of ways to arrange this. Like there, there are a number. And the whole thing that they're going for whenever they do the trigger and sear arrangement is to have a clean linear force between the trigger and the release of the sear. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to have it nice and smooth. And then I know a lot of you out there really like the idea that you can hit a wall. And then you know exactly the moment that when you put that extra pound, it's going to fire. Some of you like that. Yeah, Generally, great. in military terms, Is they're it? looking to have sort of a soft space yeah. where you just focus on pulling. You just They don't want you to flinch it. They don't want you to jerk it. They want you to just slowly pull. And somewhere in the half second that you're doing this, it'll go bang. But you don't know the exact instant. Mm. That prevents flinching. And, you know, it's just the body. It's, by the way, flinching is very natural. It's yes. the body's anticipation of a round. Uh, the first shot you ever take with a rifle is probably the best you'll have for the next two years. Mm-hmm. And then you'll spend the next two years trying, trying to, to get build out that flinch because now your autonomic system knows it, this yeah. bang's coming. i got to brace myself. So triggers are built to sort of help with that. Mm-hmm. So a single stage trigger, well, it's pretty cool. You just pull that thing and it rotates and the sear drops and then the whole thing goes off. Goes off yeah. Well, you have to make it kind of heavy because mm-hmm. you don't want any accidents. So a single stage can be very smooth and linear. It can be light or heavy. Mm-hmm. But realistically, a military rifle, you want to be fairly heavy. You don't want to wrap the gun on the ground and have, have it go off. Go off. That's not you good. don't want to have a soldier just screwing around. Because, by the way, trigger discipline was not always a thing yeah, you, look, you look at old photographs. Yeah, they're always oh, just, God. like, finger in, Oof. like, probably yeah. around in the chamber, pointing at their buddy. Yeah. Um, so you want a heavy trigger. Yeah, play it um, The other thing is what they would come up with is what's known as a two-stage trigger, which had what was known as take-up. So you have... Uh, almost no spring tension, very little spring tension on the trigger for the first bit of the pull. Mm -hmm. So you pull for a way, and then all of a sudden you hit this hard spot, and then you pull through that with much more weight, and And somewhere in there is the release of the trigger. Mm -hmm. So the two-stage trigger did a really good job of being a safety mechanism because Mm -hmm. the soldier could sit there and futz with the trigger, and until they really got in that second part and started putting the torque down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so that it did a lot to sort of put the... The soldier had a sense of being, like, not ready... And ready with their finger pulled in. Yeah. Uh, I think we're actually, you know, two stages are still around, but I think people are much more. I think the single stage is coming back. Uh, May is a big fan of it, and I think it really, in, a, in an era of trigger discipline, single stage is fine. Yeah. Um, even light triggers are pretty fine nowadays because we have other mechanisms like. To do that, yeah. Yeah, we have other safety mechanisms and things like that, but weight used to be the big safety mechanism. Um, so. Okay, two stage versus single stage. Generally, single stage is going to feel a little bit better all the way through the pull, although they can get really heavy um, yeah. if you're trying to build around it as a safety mechanism. Uh, the two stage is light followed by heavy. Mm-hmm. May talks about this all the time. Right. Uh, there's a million ways to arrange your triggers. Um, you've seen coil springs, flat springs, yeah, separate there's... sears, integrated sears. Yeah, or whether yeah, whether you're pulling the spring is like parallel or perpendicular. Like there's. I've seen a lot of ways to do it. Yeah, and we've also seen things like triggers that have the ejectors tied into them. Yep. So like the Carcano, that was yeah, a good example I, of that. I always find it fun when I see designers like melding parts together to do multiple things. All right, Bruno, we've talked about this trigger acting as sort of a safety Pseudo mechanism. Safety, yeah. What about an actual safety mechanism? Because some of these guns have that. Yeah, so a lot of times, especially uh, the mil- militaries usually want a way to like make the gun not go off. Yeah, uh, except just... the French. Yeah, they, they're the exception. Um, but generally speaking, with a mechanical safety, you want to you're trying to immobilize one or more parts of the action that, that make the gun go off, and namely either the trigger, the cocking piece, or the sear. It's usually usually with bolt action rifles, the cocking piece is the one that either houses the safety or, or the safety acts on it to uh, make the gun. Uh, safe. Yeah, so famously the Mauser 71 and other mm, descendants yeah, of that, that with the flag that safety. That flag safety has been around for ages, yeah. yeah. And what that does is it prevents the cocking piece from being able to go forward. Yeah, it's just a little half yeah. circle that just gets in the way of the lock. So no matter what we pull the trigger, it no, can't go forward. It doesn't just have to keep... It doesn't have to just sort of lock the thing to the rear. There's a weird one, the Carcano. Yeah. It has a sleeve that essentially disengages the cocking piece. Yes. So when you pull the trigger, it's not that... It's being held from going forward. It's just sort of free floated. So if you do nothing else and pull the trigger and you just release it, okay, it's fine. Yeah. But you really, really, you could pull the trigger on a Carcano and just shove that thing forward manually yeah, because it's go. just disengaged. Yeah. It's from the uh, spring. Yeah. 
Yes. So there's a couple ways to do it. Some of them are weirder than others. Mm -hmm. um, there's ones that will lock up the sear. This is actually more something that you see in the modern sense. You don't tend to see it as yeah, much, not so much before, yeah. in World War I. Mm -hmm. um, you also tend to see it in handguns and things like that. Um, but just know that it can happen that way. And then also you see trigger locks. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually struggling to think of a bolt action that uses a trigger lock. Yeah, all the ones that come to mind are like later semi-automatics. Yeah, yeah, so I much. can think of it on like later things like semi-automatic SVT40, like very yeah, lazy or the Russian thing. Yeah, oh yeah, that's true. Kind of and then um, the no, the Gettys. We just had the Gettys, and oh, they used right, the simple, yeah. but that was not a bolt action either. So no. um, if you guys can think of a bolt action no, that just no, uses no. a trigger lock, throw it in the mechanism. Yeah, or throw it in the comments. But those tend to be stupid simple because really you're just. You're not letting the trigger rotate, that's it. Yeah, um, it's literally, you can't pull the trigger. Yeah, it's just a block. I know I'm missing an example Probably, somewhere. Probably, there's but, so many. Um, those tend to be the three ways, overwhelmingly, cocking piece. We yeah. tend to control the cocking piece mm -hmm. uh, in the safety mechanism. This can be done different ways, like we said, but that's really it. It's just a mechanical safety that locks out the ability to shoot the rifle, and usually uh, it will also tie up the action so that you yeah, cannot you open, open or close. Um, and that's done for a couple reasons. Um, it can be done, A, just so that you know the gun is on safe and therefore can't be yeah. fired. Mm -hmm. There's safeties out there that do try to block the sight picture so that you know they're unsafe. Yep, that's it. Not as common as you'd think. No. Um, and then there's also a reason to lock up the action for drill and other things where you might not have it loaded, but you don't want the bolt coming loose no matter what. So right. it can also serve another purpose of it's not even there to prevent a non-cartridge in the chamber from firing. It's there just to tie up the action yeah, so, so that you can just sort of move around with yeah, it and not have any problems. Yep. So um, generally World War One, they lock up the action and keep it from firing. And mm -hmm. generally they operate on the cocking piece. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of ways to do this. Probably the most fascinating one that we've covered is the push button Arisaka safety, yeah. which sort of turns it into a little mm. keyway inside of there. And the way it manages to lock up the gun and keep that firing pin back is pretty wild. It's pretty slick. Yeah. It's not even yeah. operating on the cocking. Actually, that's one of those weird exceptions because that's operating on the 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 striker itself. Right, yeah. Like directly mm -hmm. tying up the firing pin. There's always another. Yeah, yeah this, this so standard goes out the window when you get into this stuff. There's, mm -hmm. there's weird uh, examples of how to do something every which way. Yep. Now, we are getting well through this episode, so I want to point out, this is the first time I've made Bruno sit still for more than an hour, and we have been at this for a while now tonight, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, a um, couple takes, a couple of trying to get used to what we're doing. I'm having fun, though. There's hot lamps. Yeah, There's quite hot. Don't think about the fact that there's, I mean, at least in the first week, 20,000 people watching. Yeah, no, no stress. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, I'm used to being on that side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody, please thank him for doing this for us. It's really helped us out, and it's not in his job description. Mm. So, um... We are now into magazines, right? Mm, so yes. repeating fire. Yes. Uh, we've talked about this before in the show, but for those of you who don't want to watch all that and you're just here for the 101, early experiments in magazine rifles did not use loading systems, okay? So mm. you would have to singularly load your rounds into whatever mechanism it is. So yeah. one round in, one round in, mm -hmm. one round in, okay? And meanwhile, the guy next to you is going one round, fire, one round, fire, mm -hmm. one round, fire. Mm -hmm. And on average... It it evens out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we saw with our Kropatschek episode that the sort of ease of the Kropatschek versus the sort of difficulty of learning the Verndal, which did not have... Again, it's like we said earlier with the Remington rolling blot. You kind of have to thumb the cartridge in right. there. The Verndal's not as super friendly about yeah. loading itself. So the bolt action element kind of sped up the Kropatschek. But really, the magazine itself did not speed up the Kropatschek. So... No. There's not a big reason for large European armies to ad adopt repeating rifles. No. Um, the only real pressure to have a repeating rifle at that time before loading systems was that you would be able to have a burst of overwhelming yep. fire in the event of very specific events. So a breach or cavalry charge or some Emergencies. Right. Yeah. So what you would do is you would carry around a fully loaded rifle and fire it single shot all mm -hmm. friggin' day until it's like, oh my God, and then and boom, 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 boom. Yeah. So this is coming from the plebno mentality. And by mm -hmm. the way, um, I've actually had some comments on this from people I really want to talk more about this. There's some thought that the siege of plebno did not go the way that I've described in previous episodes. Mm -hmm. Um Here's the other funny thing is there's letters from Russian generals to French generals that describe it the way that it is currently recorded as mm. the way we describe it. So 
It may be that Plevna, and by the way, I'm, I'm speaking way out of turn. Yes. Look up the Siege of Plevna. Uh, this isn't going to be in this, but the, the idea is that the Ottomans used a combination of single shot and repeating rifles to okay. fend off the Russians. Mm -hmm. Now there's some belief that the Ottomans did not do it the way we think they did, mm. and that the Russians just maybe perceived it that way. But, either way. Regardless, the narrative that leaves Russia and therefore gets picked up by the rest of the world is repeating rifles are scary, right. and we should think about adopting them. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that it took me a while to get around to is, I, I think in the modern sense, we tend to think of a magazine rifle as something that speeds up right. the rifle. But back in those days, you're not... A, you don't want this, you don't necessarily want troops to be firing from the magazine all the time because that's going to chew through ammo way faster than if they're single loading. And when you're... You know, when you you multiply that amount of shots per soldier per army, you know that that can add up. Like they don't necessarily want that. This is this is an emergency thing only. Right. So even if they could rapidly load, so right now on average, shot for shot, single load or magazine, about the same rate. Mm -hmm. If you can speed up the magazine with an auto load or the stripper clip loading system or something like that, mm -hmm. then you waste ammo faster in their minds. Yes. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. uh, even if you can't speed it up. The shots are being fired more evenly by this guy with the single shot, and they're concentrated. You're doing something, then you're like breaking your attention to load it, and then you're bringing it up, and you're going, boom, oh, oh, boom, and you feel this confidence in multiple rounds, so you're and wasting then, rounds. Yeah, you're and so there's this thought that hot shots. even if you're not wasting the ammo, you're wasting the ammo. You're, you're just sort of like you're getting over eager with it. So... Mm -hmm. It takes a while for the magazine gun to really carry out. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of odd to see. Again, I know I keep pointing at the Kropacek. Uh, a, it was a very fresh video for me. But B, it really is a weird gun. Mm -hmm. Because it's sort of that, that first understanding of what's coming next. Um, the, the Portuguese go for it because they felt that having smaller... This is coming off the French experience with their... Um, mm -hmm. uh, the French Marines found that having repeating rifles, despite the slow loading time, still... gave them a lot of punch against waved attackers mm -hmm. of superior numbers. And so it made a smaller force much more it's threatening a, it's a force for a brief period. It's a force mm -hmm. multiplier for a limited time. Mm -hmm. but... And then, but in a battlefield where people can be spooked... If you if you can get a big group of a hundred guys really racking those rounds that out, be all it, takes, yeah. it can make them kind of pause long enough to be like, oh crap, reload it. Mm -hmm. They think we're dangerous. Keep <laughs> before they figure out that this takes time. Let's yeah, just do it again. so um, the magazine has some merit mm -hmm. in and of itself. Right. Then we get into rapid loading. Mm -hmm. That changes things radically. But before we get there, let's talk about what never really got a rapid loader. Sort of the default beginning magazine. What was everybody carrying around when they first adopted magazine rifles militarily? Uh, tube loaders. Yeah. So how does that work, Bruno? You're the engineer here. Yeah. So you basically have a tube that runs parallel to the barrel below it. And you are you have some sort of pivoting elevator that basically around gets sort of pushed by the spring onto it. And then you bolt open and it tips it up. And then when you push the bolt forward, it'll pick it up, chamber it, close it. And in closing it, you lower the thing and you can repeat the cycle. Right. Now, uh, a lot of people will immediately, when they think of tube loaders, they tend to think of tip to primer issues, where yeah, the primer no of one cartridge is lined up with the point of another cartridge. Is... Uh, you don't see a lot of rimless tube loaders because that's exactly what you get. Yeah. But with a rimmed cartridge, they tip. They, they fall down. And they don't yeah. really line up very easily. It takes yeah. kind of a. I mean, you know, decades of use of the label, and I think the French may yeah, be documented gonna, 12 gonna, detonations of the magazine. It's not that often, but, it, you know, it, it is technically... I, I know no one who died or was severely I wounded it, by yeah. a detonating magazine either, so... Yeah. It, I mean, even disregarding that, though, there are, I think there are some limitations, we'll say, of the tube magazine as yes. a, a feeding system. The tube magazine, as we talked about before, it throws the balance point way out to the front, and then as you consume the rounds, the balance point moves yeah. to the rear. It also... Uh, it's... As you shorten the rifle, you're also shortening your magazine capacity, which can be, you know, right. not ideal. So off balance limits to the length uh, easily damaged. You have to protect I, it in a four stock. Yeah, and I was just going to say also because I know from personal experience, if you're taking it apart, that thing is so thin. You really you don't want to mess it up because then it's yeah. toast. And your four stock can protect that, but now your four stock is weakened as well. Yeah, because you have a big hole in yeah. it. Yeah, not great. So um, the other version of this is that there were butt. Like yeah, butt so stock tube doesn't loaders. have to be forward of the action. So yeah, we've exactly. seen a few examples of these, but not really in a bolt action. There were attempts. Mm, yeah, there were some most notably but... Monlicker's early designs. I have some drawings for those mm -hmm. where they were attempting to feed from a tube in the back. They even were trying to have multiple tubes that would rotate yeah, after they emptied. Mm -hmm. And so there were cool attempts stuff. to load from the butt, uh, not going as well not as they hoped. Really um, so. <laughs> 
So two bloaders don't. The one thing that they really don't lend themselves to is rapid loading because you have to singularly load and very control. You have to find yeah, you a gotta, place you, you and thumb yeah. in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do we start? Like what's we're coming off the tube bloater. What's really the superior magazine system? The one that really sticks. Yeah. So basically, kind of the like they call it like a box magazine or sort of getting squishing all that onto the action itself. Right. And as close to as in front of the trigger guard as you can get. Keep that balance yes. to the rear. As a matter of fact, not with necessarily, well, there are some bullpup bolt action rifles, but their bullpup designs are designs in which the trigger is in front of mm-hmm. the magazine yep. because you really want to get that magazine as in far back. between yeah. the arms mm-hmm. to get that balance here. Mm-hmm. Um, so hanging the magazine as close as you can to the front hand or not even the front hand, sorry, this, to the rear hand, as close as you can get it back, it's, the more you can sort of set that balance point back and get control of the rifle. Mm-hmm. So um, linear stacked magazines, at first yes. single stack, later yeah, we get enjoys. double stack, which allows stack. for more capacity in the same vertical That's distance. Mm-hmm. Um, box magazines are dope, and they offer a very clear advantage in that they're much easier to design around some sort of loading technology. Yes. So what options are we looking at there while we're talking about loading? So the first one of these would be like an uh, M-block or on-block clip. Uh, this is sort of invented by uh, Monlicker, where you have sort of a metal clip that holds the rounds, and the whole thing, clip and rounds, get inserted into the magazine, and they stay there until you expend all the rounds, and then it usually Yeah, they effectively out. become a part of the magazine. Yes, yeah, and that provides also like your feed lips and stuff like that, so that's one way to do it. Uh, another way would be what we call a stripper clip, where you have a little thin piece of metal that holds usually five rounds and there's a notch on the receiver that you kind of slot it into and then you push the rounds in into the magazine and then you grab the you can either grab the stripper clip and chuck it away or you can usually bolt forward and it'll push the clip out of the way it's kind of a it's a uh, disposable item yep. after that um, and the last one would be uh, what we would call a charger where you kind of it's kind of an overgrown stripper clip in that it holds the rounds you stick the whole thing into the action and then you yank the charger part of it out and you leave the rounds in there. Now those are the big three for loading a magazine, right. but we also see things like the Lee Enfield where they have detachable magazines, although mm. not, okay, this Lee Enfield's really weird. Yeah. Because it, really it was is. designed to be able to have two quick loading magazines yes. and then stripper clips for the rest of the time. Mm-hmm. Or not even that, really. Not at first, no. Not at first. Not at first. It was designed to be like, all right, well you have two magazines and so it would be magazine loaded, but then when they went to issue it, they never did that. Yeah, if I remember correctly, I think the idea was to have like a little, uh, like a chain, and you kind of, like when you yeah, take so one you out and your, then you take Well, the... you had your primary magazine, right. which was in reserve, mm-hmm. so you were supposed to single shot it. Right. And then if you got in trouble, you used that magazine, and if you got in trouble a second time, you could pop that magazine, pop in the other one, bang, bang, bang. And then, so you had one spare mag, mm. one dedicated that's, mag. Yeah, that's weird. Very weird design. <laughs> So, um, but they, again, detachable magazine by design, not by actual use. Yes. Uh, British, I know you guys love the Lee Enfield, but there's so many I twists like and too, turns in yeah, his story. It's, it's just been it's very so, steampunk. The, 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 the thing that drives me nuts is the Lee Enfield and the Mosin that got are seen as soon as like the two very simple rifles. They both have the most complicated development history and are both extremely complicated rifles in yeah. many ways. The Mosin mechanically, the Lee Enfield in terms of accessories. Yeah. Just like yeah. they just kept changing the accessories it, on it. I think it just gives us some charm <laughs> in a weird way. <laughs> I know, but everything's very simple because you could because you could buy it at a hardware store for hundred bucks that's at some it point. It's because they're they you, thought it was simple and you're like, no, it's actually just really yeah, complicated, but it's subsidized. They're confusing simplicity with ubiquitousness. Yes. Mm-hmm. So no, like a simple gun is the Carcano. Oh that God, is a yeah. simple gun. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, sorry, whining okay. aside. Mm. Um, <laughs> we're talking about magazine systems. So you can't have a detachable magazine. Mm-hmm. And then by the way, they're, again, always exceptions. Yeah. Because probably one of the weirder things is sort of what you would think as a Packet magazine, I guess, is the best way to describe yeah, it. Okay. So this was not a war gun at all, but there's the Blake rifle, which yes. I've done an article on before, which used a cylinder yeah, with yeah. cartridges clipped around it cool. that when you shoved it in the belly of the action, it actually served as the magazine system as well. And in this case, it was a rotary magazine system. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's not unlike a Monniker Schoenauer, which we've right, covered, right. that has yep. a true rotary magazine. Yeah, it almost looks like a revolver. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of, whoop, and then we have 
false rotary magazines, uh, yeah. which are actually t what you would call... People tend to think of the Krag Jorgensen as a rotary magazine because it goes up and around. Technically it rotates, but not really. It's just kind of displacing them in a curve. Yeah, so this is what's known as a capsule magazine. And really, They're you tell me, how does it work? Like it. Yeah, basically, honestly, it's a box magazine, but it's inverted. It's sort of rotated 90 degrees, and the rounds get kind of... They get pushed up around and then get dumped, sort of. Yeah, <laughs> but it still has a follower arm, mm -hmm. like a follower with an arm and some springs. It's very much like a... Yeah. Honestly, the Craig Jorgensen's follower system looks just like a Belgian 89's follower yeah, system, but turns sideways and it mm -hmm. shoves it up over a curve. Yeah, it looks so, weird, but it works the same. It yeah, works. and again, the, the, later on we have Helico magazines and other oh, yeah, craziness was... that aren't necessarily paired with bolt-action rifles all the time, but mm -hmm. I mean, there's, magazine systems are pretty wild. In World War One, though, you're mostly seeing... Sorry. You're actually mostly seeing either... Um, Vertically stacked or staggered mm -hmm. box magazines, and then some tube loaders that have managed to stay in the fight. Right. And they're generally loading from stripper clips or from end blocks, mm -hmm. and that's about it. That's, yeah, that's, that's really accurate. most of the system for World War I. One of the most common ones, yeah. All right, so we got all these elements, and we got to put them in something. It's time to talk about our stockings. Mm, yes. And I'm not wearing socks, actually, <laughs> so I guess that's in a. Uh, so we have to bed this into something, usually right. wood, yeah. right? At, this, At point, this point in time, yes. Wood. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, plastic, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. back then, your choices are wood or wood or wood. Mm -hmm. uh, the different types of wood matter. Uh, water resistance versus weight versus yep. you know the cure time yes. for production. Yeah, yeah, accessibility whole... to material. Material science on wood is radical, yes. okay? Um, and then you have to pay attention to things like which way the grain's going. Mark can talk about this. Yeah, I was going to say, there's, we have a lot of example episodes showcasing what happens with grain and stuff like that. It's, so we bed the rifle, mm -hmm. and then uh, it's got to hold the action. It's got to cradle it. And then we talked about this before, but it's got to cradle the barrel just right. Mm -hmm. um, when we have a stepped barrel especially, the stock is very influential on how that rifle sets up and how that barrel stacks up. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, we have to decide, do we want a handguard and how long? Right. Um, or how long the stock itself is. On some carbines and things like that, yeah, just, you just have cutback carbines. Like you have some weird Belgian ones out there where they just, they're just they half length like a hunting rifle. Mm -hmm. um, usually we stock all the way to the end because we want to fit a bayonet. That's yes. really the big reason to get all the way up to the end on that stock is to fit a bayonet. And then also that plus the handguard are for bayonet fighting. Yep. So you want a handguard on the upper part of the guns so that you can grip, you know, I mean, yeah, I don't know why I'm... <laughs> like, yeah, you have an example. Yeah. yeah, you want to be able to grab the whole gun so that when there's a bayonet uh, yeah. on the end, you can just... Which is why there's at least on most of these guns later mm -hmm. on... The retrofit, half. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, on black powders, they didn't tend to heat up because they were single shot. Um, they were Well, I mean, they're magazine black powders, but generally single shot. Generally, black powders stay cooler than smokeless. Mm -hmm. So they didn't heat up enough to really was, need yeah, an upper hand. It wasn't a problem they had run into yet. Yeah. yeah but, uh, once we get into smokeless repeaters, that, especially, yeah, stuff heats guard. up, yeah. And a lot of times, all the way to the end of the gun, because mm -hmm. you can really get out there and control the bayonet. Mm -hmm. um, but half hand guards, at least, for most Something, smokeless yeah. repeaters. Mm -hmm. um, really, really big, important thing. I mean, we see that one was added. Again, I know I keep mentioning it to Kropacek, but the Kropacek had one added later, even yep. because they had to... Once they got around to using smokeless ammo for it, they were like, ooh, ooh, this is getting hot. Get yeah. hot. I try, yeah, I've grabbed some barrels that get kind of toasty, and you're like, ooh, you don't want to do that again. Yeah, yep. so. Um, so uh, handguards can be used to protect the sights. They can use to sort of move up onto and protect the front of the barrel. Mm -hmm. um, they can also help, a lot of people don't realize this, with heat mirage. So as the gun starts mm -hmm. cooking and the barrel's giving off heat, yes. if there's no handguard to protect that, you can get ripples that, in that front really of your sight. That messes with you. Yeah, yeah. mess with your so, vision. Mm -hmm. So uh, another thing with stocks is at the wrist. Yes. Uh, May talks about this a lot. A lot yeah. of guns were straight wrist. Uh, generally, that was because A, it was simple, and B, ever so slightly, there's a sort of advantage to bringing it down and single loading with a straight wrist. Mm -hmm. It's still Straight wrists are still popular for some sporting shotgun applications where you want to get from the hip to your shoulder very quickly. Uh, and you're not that worried about getting a tuck in, mm -hmm. but a semi-pistol grip wrist like this one here with a peak is used by the ring and pinky fingers especially to pull that really thing grabber. into your shoulder nice and tight. Gives you just a good grip and good control over the rifle. Mm -hmm. uh, May will say time and again she prefers a semi-pistol grip stock. Okay. There is a disadvantage to trying to produce these though, as Mark will yell at you, and that goes back to what, Bruno? Uh, grain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, trying to find a piece of wood and get the grain cut just so that oh, this man. guy doesn't actually crack or snap off. It's, it's tricky, especially if you've got to build them in a hurry. Yeah. yeah. And we talked about this in the Type 38 Japanese Arisaka episode mm -hmm. because those guns use a two-piece stock mm -hmm. in order to get around that problem. They're able to cut the grain how they yep. need it for the wrist 
And for the toe of the stock, see. because that's the other place that's usually, you see chipped toes a lot oh, yeah. because of that same grain issue. Just shears off. Yeah. So it's interesting, but the, you know, a lot of countries could have learned from that. They could have had semi-pistol grip stocks without the unnecessarily steep cost of having the right wood and cutting the wood at the cutting the wood in the right direction for it, that semi-pistol grip yeah, it, can be pretty wasteful. Yes, it can be. So yeah, uh, stocks pretty clear. Um, I suppose the only thing I'm thinking of is uh, very rare in World War One. Very rare overall, but the French seem to be fans of it. Um, two piece stocks. Yeah. So one of the things that you have to take account when you're you're hollowing out all this wood to fit the magazine is that you're removing the wood and you're you're making it weaker the the bigger of a hole you have in there. So by uh, making that whole part out of metal instead. You don't have to worry about that, and you basically you bring some strength back into the whole system. Yeah. Uh, so two piece stock separates out probably the thinnest portion um, when it comes to the label, but then there's something like the Lee Enfield where it has a two piece stock technically. Yes. But what it's really done is it's isolated the butt stock where all that recoil is impulsing, mm. and it's getting all the way around it's that center it. section. It's using up mm -hmm. the best parts of the stock to bear for recoil. And it's isolated the forestock and that magazine protecting portion where it really isn't taking a lot of weight. Like it's, yep. it's being vibrated and it could be impacted against from the side if you're carrying it around. Yep. But realistically, you've you've put in all the strength where it needs to be in this one compact piece of wood. Mm -hmm. Also, two-piece stocks probably lent themselves to easier manufacture because yeah. you can cut up what wood you have yeah, so and you, use smaller pieces. You have pieces. more flexibility in what you can use. Yep. Yep. Uh, now, of course, you have to fit them, but uh, yeah. I, I think it works out pretty well with a two-piece stock. I'm surprised it didn't catch on you know, yeah. much further beyond, except for that, again, in a sporting application or a peacetime application, they do look, they tend to look more attractive. I was going to say, yeah, it's an aesthetic thing, which doesn't necessarily matter for yeah. pragmatically, but yeah, they tend to look, single piece ones look nicer. Now, other concerns about the stock is sort of related and not related is uh, where we put our bands for our slings. Mm -hmm. um, if it's an infantry rifle like this one's set up for, they'll both be on the underside. So yeah, you carry it over your shoulder that. like a continental soldier. Uh, if you happen to be cavalry or someone like that, you're probably going to mm -hmm. want to put the slings on the opposite side of the bolt handle so that the bolt handle sticks out away from your back. The gun is tucked up tight. Um, you see it for artillery and bicycle troops and mm -hmm. things like that. They want slings to the side or some combination or option yep. thereof. Um, so sling configuration counts. Yep. Uh, it counts big. Uh, infantry don't really necessarily want to carry the gun slung sideways, although mm -mm. we will see standard side slings later on in things like the German Car 98K sure. because they're carrying a, a standard short rifle. Mm -hmm. But marching infantry long distance, no mechanized warfare, uh, generally you want that single point over the shoulder, nice broad sling, nice Spread, linear yeah. marching with you, sitting off to the side of your body. Mm -hmm. That's the way they liked it. Yeah. All right. Um, otherwise, I can't think of anything that really stands out. Although, again, there are probably elements that we're skipping. Um, mm. Other than just saying, oh, you know, I, you know, I can cover it here. We talked about the bayonet fighting. Uh, mm. The bayonet lug at the front is not necessarily a function of the stock, but the stock has to be blended into it. Yeah, you got to interface with it. Somewhere. In order to provide rigidity and strength and not snap off at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's another major component of the stock's role. It also has to fit a uh, cleaning rod channel if it has a cleaning rod either down the center or on the side. There's other options there, but generally this is just, this is the part of the gun that you, the human interface with more Almost often than you think. Mm -hmm. You know, we think about interfacing with the bolt. We think about interfacing with the loading system because that's the exciting part. Right. But, but as a soldier, yeah, you're interfacing with that stock yeah. way more than anything else. Yeah. It gets into those ergonomics again, where it's just like little things, but they can add up to handling the rifle and how much you enjoy using it. Yeah, oh, and we skipped this in the magazine section, but having a flush magazine versus one that mm. sticks out yes. can really save on the hip. Yep. You know, it can save on pounding on your back or your sides. Um, you know, guns that have sort of distended magazine systems actually have a lot of wear. I mean, there are even examples of Dutch guns where they put wood pieces over their Monlicker magazines yeah, so that they wouldn't ruin their uniforms. Yep. All right, Bruno, will you help me demonstrate something? Sure. Okay. Here, I'm going to take this rifle. You mm -hmm. hold the front bit there for a second, okay. right near the front sight, let's say. Okay. All right, so here's the problem. I can look at that front sight and ignore the rear, and I can point at something, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I could be over here and look at the front sight and point at that same thing, and the truth is, I ain't, I'm not going to mm -hmm. hit it. Like, my front sight's in front of that pistol over there on the wall, but I'm not hitting that thing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this is because... I have vertical and horizontal variable here. So I need a front sight and a rear sight. They have to be brought into alignment both on the 
vertical and the horizontal so that I can be assured that the gun is straight when I point at something. Now this is obviously a really good marksman position is to just, <laughs> but you guys get the idea. So um, we need a way to mark out vertical and horizontal and keep the gun in alignment while shooting it. So uh, to do that, we have a couple options. Now first, let's talk sort of sight radius because we have two places to possibly mount this rear sight. Where do we put it? Well, so, in this example, you could put it on the barrel itself and just have it there. And that's what really most of them are during World War I. Or later on, you see, you can move it back onto like the back of the receiver bridge somewhere around there. Now, a lot is happening at the back of the gun. In a lot of cases, they had split bridge receivers and things and like that we it, talked about. It's crowded. It's yeah. hard to put a sight at the rear of the gun. It also messes with the milling operations and there's ways to attach and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, is there any real reason to put it at the rear? I think I already said the word. Yeah, sight radius. So extending the sight radius uh, basically makes it better in terms of shooting because there's you can pick up discrepancies between the front and rear more readily so that you'll just be more accurate basically. Right, so if you're a degree off when they're this far apart, the arc that describes really shows you you're a degree off. When mm -hmm. they're this close and you're a degree yeah, off, yeah, yeah, it's you hard can't to really perceive it. So mm -hmm. this is the advantage of sight radius, of extended sight radius, and that's why you see target pistols with big stretch yeah, out sights. Really long ones, yeah. So <clears throat> they knew this, Mm -hmm. They still chose to put on the barrel for the most part because so, so. effectively in a V-notch sight or U-notch or square notch, whatever this notch may be, mm -hmm. uh, you have a system where you have a front sight, you have a rear set of, well, you have a rear notch, yeah, a you're aligning the top, you're aligning the center, mm -hmm. uh, you're good to go, right? Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Still standard for handguns today. Yes. Um, and perfectly good way of lining up sights, but you do have to kind of pay attention. You have to pay attention to two variables and then look down the sights. And you yeah, can get good at it. It takes some practice, yeah. But it's not necessarily a natural process. So mm. um, the barrel stays there because it's well out of the way of the action. It's easy to mount there. And the advantages of sight radius don't count that much until, well, we find another way of setting yeah. up the front and rear sight. We have a rear sight that is slightly different. What's this? Yeah, so that's what we call an aperture sight. So I think from what's going to be like a Garen or something like that, where you just have a, a, a circle basically way back and then you line that up with the front notch. And the human eye is very good about sort of trying to center. If, you, if you're looking through a circle, it will try and, you'll try and naturally center the sight. So it's just a very uh, a, a very easy way to uh, line up a yeah. set of sights. The rear aperture sight for most people is, it's very easy to watch your target. Mm -hmm and just sort of have your mind put that stuff in alignment. Oh, yeah. Like it just does it very organically. It's mm -hmm. a psychological trick. Yes. Um, and it's beautiful, it speeds up training, it speeds up on the fly accuracy. Mm -hmm. It's not as good sometimes for trying to shoot very, very precisely. Yeah. But, but realistically, man sized target at multiple hundred yards. You're fine. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this gets seen on like a very advanced rifle for its time that we love very mm -hmm. much, P14. Yep. US 1917, yep. um, and the reason that these guns have sights mounted on the receiver is because now the advantage of that sight yeah, radius yeah. is we're getting it in addition to the need yes. to deliver the ring it's to the of, eye. It has to be very close, otherwise it doesn't really work. Yeah. Yeah. And I have seen, by the way, at least <laughs> one gun with a barrel-mounted rear aperture sight. Uh, yeah, uh, that's the, the Colombian Madsen. That uh, is, so I've weird. shot one and it's just so weird. Yeah. Uh, is the most bizarre attempt I've had at trying to see what I'm doing. Mm. I would not recommend a rear or a barrel-mounted barrel -mounted aperture, aperture sight. Mm, no. Um, so okay. So we have that, and then we have uh, the rear sights themselves, whether they are, let's ignore the aperture for a second, because those tend to be, well, no, no, no. Yeah. Even in World War One, aperture sights tended to be attached to one of some very basic oh, sure. sighting systems. Sure, sure. Um, can you name, like, the two most popular for World War Two? Yeah, so for World War I. World War I. <laughs> it's gonna have I'm sorry, it's been a late so, night. Yeah, so basically it's either what we call a ladder sight or a tangent sight. So the latter side is basically just something you kind of fold up, uh, sort of perpendicular to the, the rifle, really, and you just you adjust it however range, whatever range you want to set it to, and you look through it. Uh, a tangent sight is more uh, sort of a movable, the notch kind of slides up on this tangent piece of metal, and you just set it to wherever you want, and you can look through it. Right. So in a ladder sight, the sight is just mounted on a hinge on the barrel, mm -hmm. and, or receiver, yeah, and yeah. it just pivots on that one point, pops up, and you dial in your range. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the reason you need to dial in your range, let me probably scan again, is that if uh, we talked about this flat shooting thing earlier, uh, cartridges or bullets fire in an arc. 
So uh, if somebody's really far out, Gravity. we want to dial our site in, this being a tangent site here, so that when I try to point for that same point, uh, so the same target, yeah, you'll compensate. I naturally, like, now is lifting the barrel automatically to account for that arc. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all it is. You're just trying to get that barrel up while still you get to point straight at it. Mm -hmm. But the barrel is angled it. for you mm -hmm. so that it will hit that more distant target. So on a ladder site, you just fold it up 90 degrees on a hinge. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is uh, it's easily, for like yeah. knocked around, but then it's easily broken. They're, They're very really fragile. fragile. The, the springs and adjustment systems say, yeah, have to be especially very... Especially if they're old, they get kind of weak and they don't... You lift and it'll just fall back yeah. down. So. The, the earlier ones didn't have springs. You just lift up the, the crossbar oh, yeah, yeah, and then just... if they got ruined, they got ruined. Well, yeah. then they had spring locking systems so that when you fired, they didn't slip around. Right. Well, then those have to hang out there on a ladder. Yeah, it's, it's a real thin piece of metal. So yeah, like yeah. Ottoman 1893 is a good example of this. They get broken all the time or mm -hmm. bent up all the time. I've never seen an Ottoman 1893 yeah, in any all, condition yeah, without that beat bend. Um, so up. not the best with the ladder. So mm. the, the, a very common thing that came up and what we'll see a lot in World War One and World War Two are mm. tangent, where it's just a shaped piece of metal, just a curved piece of metal, and then a literally a tangent piece of flat stripped metal with mm -hmm. the sight markings on it and a crossbar that doesn't, I mean, it can be spring loaded, it doesn't have, it doesn't to, have be. to be, um, but you just lift it up, slide the thing to where you want it to be on the markings mm -hmm. and let it back down and that stops it at the right point on the curve. It's much and stronger. You mm -hmm. literally have a tangent line to a right. curve that creates that height that you need. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other examples. Um, World War II, we definitely see, with, like you said, the Garand with the aperture sight, just a dial. Yeah. And little, just... there's little sliders and stuff like mm -hmm. the 1903 right. A3 and stuff like yep. that. That's crazy. Um, but World War One, sort of the other big uh, one that we see a lot of is the quadrant site, which is a close cousin to the yeah, tangent. Variation. Yeah, yeah um, this is on uh, Austro-Hungarian 1888 rifles, mm -hmm. uh, 1890 carbines, and then the Italians, the yeah, Carcano. Stuff, yep. Um, yep. So these are set up to be essentially another tangent to a curve, but the tangent is set down in the curve. Yeah, and it's more like a ratcheting type of... Yeah, it's like there's like teeth on the yeah, inside of the it. shells. Yeah, um, they usually have like the curve. They're, very, they're more pronounced usually, I find as well. It's yeah. Kind of, kind of beefy. Very strong oh, and yeah. very positive it, lock. Oh, yeah, it'll hold. Yeah, that's, yeah uh, mm -hmm. these are also seen on Dutch Monlickers, by the way. Yes. Uh, Bruno, if you had to pick the best site <laughs> of World War One, would you agree with me that it's like the P-14? Yeah. Uh, aperture, rear mount, yeah. still... Technically a ladder site, which is kind of weird. Yeah, but no, yeah, I definitely enjoy using that one. Okay. Right. Now, if you had to pick the weirdest site, <laughs> uh, what would you go with? Probably the German, the Langevisier, the roller coaster kind yep. of site. That thing is absolutely wild. They wanted very positive control. However, this did a lot to damage your per sort of peripheral vision when you tried yeah. looking down. It looks pretty, though. Yeah, it's <laughs> super cool. Also, Fun to play with. if I remember, the, I think the minimum is like 400 meters zero or something. Like, it's not, yeah, it's not um, super great for... That's another point. A lot of the guns were set up for oh God, very yeah. long ranges, and then they ended up fighting very close. So yeah. your minimum settings would be... Okay. I mean, the Germans were like 400 meters, but a lot of places were like, like two or 300 meters. I don't know of any country that had a 100 meter fixed for your sight. Yeah. They really thought they were going to fight at in excess of 100 meters. Well, long. yeah, it was the case of, like, the gun can reach that far, but the soldier can't necessarily hit that target or even see something that far away. Now, a lot of guns had, in while we're talking about this, is what's known as mm, a battle yes. site. There would be a fold forward position or yeah, a fold back kind of position, a just a neutral position neutral. that was fixed for a very accessible distance with a very decent, mm -hmm. we talked about this before, but... Um, Point blank range, mm -hmm. and so it'd be 200, 300 meters, right. and some four. Sure. Um, that battle site usually was just like where the sites were that they're most compact and mm -hmm. less likely to take damage. Yep. And then if you wanted to do long range shooting, then yeah, you pop it. them up, and yeah. then they end up in that place where they're at risk of damage. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, you know, by the way, if you want a really good discussion of sites, watch our Craig Jorgensen episodes oh, because God. the US <laughs> went back and forth God, between yeah. the tangent so and the ladder. Over and over oh, and over again. It's hilarious. Um, absolutely wild. So the only other real thing to consider with sites is site protection. So mm -hmm. the sites themselves could be rigid like the Longa Vizier. Mm -hmm. Or you could have site protectors like the Lee Enfield where it has those little yeah. ridges that come up. Mm -hmm. Front site protectors may or may not be there. Um, mm -hmm. Front site protectors also help avoid shadow. Yep. Um, light coming in and changing the shape of the front sight. I don't think about, but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So hoods and protectors do a lot of that. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You want to you want to make sure you know if you if you damage those sights, the gun's kind of not very usable. So you want to make sure they don't they don't get bent or broken or whatever. Yep. 
1917 famously has this big right, rear, yeah. like looks like a 57 Chevy. Um, <laughs> yeah. But hey, it works. It keeps yeah. them safe. Uh, yeah, and then that. I think sort of the last thing is kind of weird. Uh, ladder sites can do this operation. Uh, there's extensions that I've seen that go on tangent sites and there's stuff that do this operation. I've also seen separate sites like on the Lee Enfield, mm. Volley Fire. Ah, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, did you want to explain that one? Yeah, so there was this idea at the time of, of using sort of very long range indirect fire, almost, I, I almost call it artillery like in that sense, where we're talking like maybe, you know, hundreds or thousands of meters or yards or whatever the unit they were using. But usually, I think, the, again, Liam Field comes up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's very slow. But it's we're, basically we're talking like 2,000 meters plus. Yeah, yeah. Basically, like you have a, and usually a group of people, like a whole platoon or something, and, you know, they're like, all right, set it for whatever, two, yeah, 2,000, and then. It's usually a, a sites that are set offset off to the side. You set it, and then you just, you know, it's kind of indirect fire, kind of long range, you know. Yeah, the idea is actually interesting because it came full circle in World War One. The idea right. was to create like a beaten zone, which, yeah. by the way, they started doing with machine guns. Yeah, the idea of sound, yeah. Like you would just rain lead on a certain position, like light artillery to harass or deny movement mm -hmm. through a certain area, which is very hard to maintain with men because it ties down a lot of men. Right. It burns a lot of ammunition, although ammunition would be burned either way. Sure. Um, it's When you're doing it with just men, it's very inaccurate and yeah. very hard to get it's, them to actually it, hit the same zone. It's not a very efficient way to do it. I don't yeah. know a single confirmed kill from volley fire. Yeah. But it, the concept returns with the beaten zone with machine mm -hmm. guns, as we're going to see. Yep. All right. So um, I think that really... there's. I mean, there's a million ways to as read sites. There's mm -hmm. always variants, guys. Again... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is just a broad perspective. I know I've repeated that several times, but I know we're still going to get comments. You uh, forgot yeah, X, Y, or Z. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Sometimes you say it. Yep. All right, Bruno, we're down to everybody's favorite part of the trip mm. the accessories. Mm, all the extras. Yeah. It's your favorite part, right? Sure. Unless I have to make them, then that's not <laughs> that part's not so fun. All right, there's some stuff that we can't really get into detail with, like slings, where the U.S. had like the cool oh, 1903s yeah, yeah. thing, and then other people had simple sure. leather slings, and some of them, you know, slings can aid and aim yeah, and bracing hold. or not. It depends on the country and their preference. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about sort of the most basic stuff. So, in terms of taking care of the rifle, uh, we mentioned this briefly, but cleaning rods. Right. Um, mm -hmm. What are our options here? We got like the rod. Um, yeah, I mean, you have a, a rod or either like a pull through or a well, rod. Yeah, a rod. Either, <laughs> either whole or segmented, I guess, would be the yeah. other one. So, uh, Kakarno famously would have a seg, like the carbine would have a segmented rod yeah, in the buttstock. Go, you'd have to go. Yeah. The long rifle had an actual rod. Mm -hmm. um, the British moved towards a pull through system with yep. the Lee Enfields. Oh. Um, also, a lot of guns still had cleaning, or they would take their cleaning rod and they'd get rid of it, but they'd have a clearing rod. So, it was a rod designed. Yeah, only to remove like a squib or something yeah, or a stuck casing or something yeah mm -hmm. and yet not really meant for cleaning the gun because there'd yeah. be a cleaning kit somewhere else right. um so rods have their function as a matter mm -hmm. of fact we've been on range plenty of times and wanted to have a rod it's they're um, very useful yes i don't know what i'd do without one sometimes yeah. uh, but generally as ammo got better there really wasn't a need yeah. for the rod anymore no. um, and, yeah and also getting rid of the rod means you don't have to cut a channel for it, it Lightens up the gun a little bit technically because you don't have the whole piece of metal, so there's some incentive to get rid of it. But in a lot of cases, the rod had a secondary function that you then have to make up for when you get rid of the rod, which is stacking. True, yes. So, uh, did you want to explain stacking? Because this is a concept that people miss out on whenever we talk yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. I started out to do it myself before it kind of clicked in my head yeah. as well. <laughs> but basically, you know, usually when they're, you know, soldiers are marching, you camp somewhere, you know, you want to stack the rifles somewhere right but if you're in the middle of the field somewhere you, know, you don't have like a wall necessarily so basically you'd basically kind of lock rifles together in some fashion and kind of form either like a tp or three. not that you sleep under but just a no, way no, no. to just, keep just the just rifle. To keep keep the action out of the mud it's basically wet, snowing yeah. icing whatever, whatever yeah. you don't want that on the ground yeah you want to keep it up the you, don't, you don't want to just throw it on the floor that's or yeah. the ground that's no good so yeah. yeah, it's kind of K31s are notorious for having scuff marks on their buttstocks from being stacked in the snow, mm -hmm. and then they freeze at the base, and then right. people would have to kick them back off. So and there's all these just... scuffs at the bottom. But yeah, the stacking rod, stacking hook, mm -hmm. this can come in a number of forms. The cleaning rod could have served as a stacking rod. Yeah, you can use them to lock into each other. You could have a separate rod on the gun or a hook on the gun that yeah. was there for that mm -hmm. purpose. Um, so like the LaBelle tends to have one. Right. 
Um, or uh, you could have a quillion on the bayonet that would serve as a stacking yep, rod. Sure. More on that in a moment. So you could use the bayonet to lock the rifles. Um, okay, so we got cleaning rods, clearing rods. Um, other accessories may include weirder stuff, like the Arisaka Type 38 had a dust cover. Oh, sure. Oh. Which was designed to yeah. just keep mud and muck out of the action. And then in World War One, we actually see dust covers appearing for other guns, mm -hmm. like the Gewehr 98 and the Labelle. Yeah, suddenly keeping mud out of the action becomes a priority for Yeah, almost countries. when there's a ton of mud. Um, actually, we missed this on the stocks, but the, the Type 38 has a stock designed to shed water. Like it has yes. the notch yep. and other places to get yeah. water back yeah, out of the action because mm -hmm. it was... By the way, it's Type 38, brilliant stock. Yeah, way, like yeah. lightweight wood, two-piece construction. And, Super slick. Or not two-piece, but two-piece buttstock construction right. and water shedding. And, a, yeah, and we got the cool like dust coat. There's all sorts of cool stuff for that gun. Um, also, uh, kind of the big accessory for a lot of these guns, the bayonet. We've briefly mm. talked about those. Uh, but um, we have some bayonet choices. So mm -hmm. name some example bayonets for me. So the, the earliest form would be kind of just a, a cruciform kind of spike, just kind of for poking people. But eventually by World War One, we see sort of a, an evolution into a, a knife kind of bayonet, sort of a service knife that can be used for other things, but also clipped on as a bayonet on the rifle. Those are kind of your big two variants. And there were some experiments with like like really, really long sword bayonets, but those, I mean... Yeah, like Yadagons and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, but really World War One, one of the many lessons is... Make it shorter. Yeah, keep it easy. Keep it firm. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want snapping off. That too. Um, there are other, by the way, there's experiments with bolo bayonets. Oh, yeah. With, like, spade bayonets. Yeah, actually, that came to mind. Yeah, there's experiments. Yeah, there's just something that, can we shovel with it while we use Yeah, it? I mean, there's always, there's always an attempt to try and, like, combine kit together, because yeah. why not, if it works? And then uh, on the bayonet, you may have a hook that's attached to the bayonet. This sure. is known as the quillion. Right. This is used in fencing right, in order to, to kind of snag. Build. It's mm -hmm. it's a sword catch. Yep. But realistically, nine times out of ten, the quillion was used for stacking of arms. Yeah, I really. Yeah. Um, we tend to play up its fighting aspects. The I'm Japanese, not sure how much it was used. Yeah, I mean, the Japanese like theirs because they thought sure it was did. essential for parrying and things like that. Yeah. But eh, I wonder how much it got used. Yeah, yeah I, mostly it was for stacking rifles. Mm -hmm. Like nine ninety nine 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 out of hundred, yep. stack your rifles. That's really the big use for it. Mm -hmm. But um, the interesting thing to me is, I always thought this was interesting. If I have a knife bayonet mm -hmm. with a quillion, so I'm yep. using the knife bayonet to lock my rifles. Right. Well, now I've set up camp, I lock my rifles, I got no knife. That's a good point. Yeah. I don't know why, but that's always <laughs> stood out to me. Yeah. It's just sort of like a, uh, uh, never mm, mind. Yeah, good yeah, point. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. So, um, all right, back to the topic. Uh, yeah. Anything else we can attach to the front of the gun other than a bayonet? Well, one of the things that was, became kind of popular in the first war was uh, rifle grenades. Yeah, okay. So the most primitive form of these, just... You're just a little, like, a rod. You just kind of stuck it in there. Yeah, kinda... often used with a blank fire cartridge. Right, yeah, you need some way to propel it. Yeah, yeah. although there were attempts to move away from that. So you'd see uh, uh, rifle grenades that either had a pass-through system, like the French VBs. Yeah. Uh, so the cartridge, the bullet, you'd fire a bullet in the... The, the bullet that's, would like that makes me, go yeah. through and propel and set off, like it would even like set off the, um, basically pulling the pin for the, my brain's falling, failing me late at night. But, yeah. Um, you know, pulling the pin on the grenade. Yeah. You, you, by firing the bullet through it, which is terrifying. Uh, there are other ones where they would capture the bullet. Yeah. If you shoot a bullet into a, you know, hit the grenade. And then it would... That's terrifying. Yeah. So, um. Generally, though, like what a lot of people think of tend to be the cup launchers. So, like right. the Lee Enfield had one of these yeah. that was attachable yep. with a little adjustable vent that for was range. The big difference, yeah, you could you could yeah. dial it in, yeah, yeah, because it would let you project a grenade further than you could throw it, essentially. Kind yeah, of give it a bit more long range and probably mm -hmm. a bit more scientifically. Like, you yeah, you could probably, yeah, and, yeah, you could probably dial it in a bit more, be yeah. more precise. Um, generally, by the way, these were expected to be used with the butt on the ground. Yeah, you do twist not. Twist it around. Yeah, don't, face down. don't shoulder that. <laughs> if you, do you not. If you happen to fire one for some reason at some point, don't, no. don't shoulder it. Um, and then, uh, famously, this would result on the Lee Enfield uh, with having to have an extra yoke rifle, which is you would have to wrap a wire or a yes. steel band yeah, yeah. because they were having, since they had was, a full stock with a full handguard and the vibration coming off that thing would just it's like It's a lot of mass burst getting the wood. Yeah, it's not necessarily designed for it per se, so yeah, it, would, it would shatter. Yeah. Stocks, yeah. So um, rifle grenades um, and then other weird stuff. Like we've seen stuff like 
uh, little wire cutters that would. Yeah, yeah. All it did was like you'd leave live cartridges in the gun and you'd shove it into a piece of wire, boom, boom, boom. and then you just pull the trigger and it would just line up the wire so that the bullet snapped the wire. Right. So pretty useful for yeah, trench clearing. Yeah. Lots of cool stuff that you can snap to these. Other little accessories like night sights. Yeah, like yeah, you know, radium early, painted. Yeah. I don't know about radium, but whatever they were painted uh, with. My mind says tritium, but I'm not sure they had that yet. Yeah. yeah. Just some sort of luminescent, like, yeah, glow Don't in the lick dark. it. Yeah, don't do Don't that. lick yeah, it. Don't do that. Um, but, you know, night sights and other advantages like that. So there's a lot of ways to sort of dress the rifle. Yeah, there's a lot of experimentation with coming, or finding solutions to problems that kind of crept up in World War One. Yeah. So um, I know we're kind of wandering at the end here, but I'm just trying to make sure we covered everything. But I mean, overall, yeah. I think you're getting the point. Mm. Um there's a million ways to solve this problem, and the worst part is, as much as we've described this, uh, we haven't described a fifth of it. Oh, God, like, no. Both yeah, of us it's... have sat here and tried to add more things, or we've gotten through a segment and gone, oh, I should have mentioned this, or I should have mentioned that. Yeah. Um, and this is all bolt-action rifles. Yeah, it's not even getting into anything, any other type of weapon. Yeah. yeah um, no. So, I understand if, if it's not your thing to watch, you know, an hour on whatever gun we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But if you say that it's just the same thing over and over again, uh, I think you might be missing some incremental development and an incremental understanding that leads to very not you know everybody thinks of these big changes like and then they invented the AK forty seven and it was amazing and it's like yes uh, but, that comes from other innovation that comes from other innovation that's, that comes from, yeah it's that's, it's one step at a time that's the fun I mean for me that's the, the I think have the one of the most fun parts of working on this is just seeing the, 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 how all the pieces line up in time and just kind of spread out because yeah it's just. It's one invention after another, and then these people use it this way, they use it that way, and it just, I just love seeing how it sort of splays out over time. Yeah, and it's never perfect either. You oh, see these no, loops. No, no. You see a gun go so far forward and then reach back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or you see people coming up with the same solution in different places at the different times. Yeah, of, you know. or you see stuff that gets dragged back out because it's just useful. So, like, yeah, you know, we see, like I said, we saw a lot of black powders dragged out, but again, I want to reiterate, Tiga Bear... Mm. It, it was supposed to be a stopgap because they were developing a machine gun. I never got around to it. <laughs> and like, but they got the gun out because they could. It was just yeah, that yeah. either. Like, we know how to make one of these. Yep. And they got it out there and they they fielded it. And the dang thing, it's based on a Mauser 98 action it's essentially. Kind of just beefed up. But it has Mauser. There's elements of it that are from the Mauser 71. Oh yeah. It, it's single shot. Yeah, it works. So why not? We it's a single shot we gun. Works, we'll yeah. go back to the Mauser 71 because that worked. It was easy and mm -hmm. it was straightforward and it was a good idea at its time. So. Yeah. I mean, you see old elements and even the newest things in the war. Yeah, I think one of the takeaways is when we look at all these guns, I guess, in a modern perspective or, or kind of, you know, hindsight being 2020, we're like, oh, yeah, that was clearly the right solution. Or why did they stick with that for so long? But in the moment, you know, you can't, it's very hard to accurately predict the future, especially in a time when small arms are evolving so rapidly year by year. Um, it's just there's a lot of variability. Yeah. So, uh, again, um, as we're wrapping this out, I know some of you might be coming in for the 101 part and you maybe mm -hmm. didn't watch our whole series. Uh, I will point out one final thing. It's sort of, I don't know how to segue this in, mm -hmm. but uh, when we talk about World War One, it's not so much that these things were invented during the war. Right. It's that they were developed before, and then the war served as the great sort of event. It's the meteor the that hits the earth. Yeah. Yeah. And so evolution is a process in which there's uh, almost infinite variation, and then a culling. Yes. And so what survives World War One yes. is what was already invented, right. but, it, was but just, it worked. Right, the better solution. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of it works, by the way, the selection is not what's the smartest, strongest, no, whatever. if it's good enough, yeah. Yeah, it's the selection is what replicates mm -hmm. in fields. So, um, you know, we see things like the Mauser 98 uh, export style rifles become sure. very popular. The Gewehr yeah. 98 does well, but the Car 98 AZ Oh, that's good. So mm. the Germans go with a standard short rifle right. with this beautiful yeah, action and the rear mounts, like the, the simpler sight that mm -hmm. Mauser tried to sell them originally. Right. But at the same time, Russia doubles down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because, by the way, they, their system is switched. They go to a system where human labor is very cheap and available. So they're and they're very complicated bolt action rifle that has many failings. Well, they can either brute force labor more of them, mm -hmm. or they can invest in innovation, invention, and a whole new assembly. Yeah, okay, Russia's yeah. going to go with the brute force option. Yeah, when you got to build millions of them, you're going to... Yeah, they just, the, the, the time it would take to innovate and implement yeah. is not worth just overproducing. A lot of the, yeah, so many times it comes down to just like bureaucratic inertia or just the cost of changing. You don't really think about that. Right. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's so, gambling that a lot of people don't want to do necessarily. When you watch the series, you'll start to get... 
I guess, a different flavor for what's going on. You might stop thinking of the Mosin as being a yeah. cheap, simple gun with a few problems. Right. You might see it as something that has <laughs> inherent design flaws and but is over, like just, overly complex. Any other nation that produced the Mosin, it would have been radically expensive. Oh, me. God, yeah. And so... But they just kind of, they found a way. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of brute force their way through it. Or you may see something like the Springfield 1903 as a piece of American exceptionalism until you realize that it's just a copy of the Mauser 98 slash Mauser 93 uh, yeah. at different... Ev so, you know, this... I think the series can open your eyes to how much the world of arms development was interlocked mm -hmm. and how much of it was just a guessing game until the pieces started getting knocked down and what was left was what feedback, was left. Yeah. Yep. All right, so I hope you enjoyed it. Again, uh, if you're in the comments, by all means, if you feel like we missed something, say it. Like, yeah. share it with each other. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people viewing this at some point. Mm. Um, everybody, seriously, Bruno's not only on camera, so <laughs> he's way outside his comfort zone. Make sure you say thank you to him. Um, and he, this is the man behind all those beautiful animations you see yeah. all the time. Who took a chance, by the way. He came here to Charleston to work with us because yeah. uh, I think he was really bored. Yeah, and you were like the first person to like get back to me, so I was like, <laughs> we're sold. That counts for a lot. Yeah, it could have been passion or interest, but no, it was just convenience. In a way. Part of it. But um, no, it's seriously, we love having Bruno. Mm. Um, hopefully you guys love his work too. Mm. Also, he's the man behind all the big improvements to Anvil lately. Mm -hmm. He and Mark have been working very tightly to get that show going. I mm. highly recommend watching Anvil. It's, it's really picking it's up very, its pace. Yeah. It's very cathartic to see stuff get... Clean yeah, up. the shop's getting put together, and mm -hmm. you know, there's yeah. a lot of excitement around then, this whole channel. Yeah, so, um, thank you all again for all your support. Uh, good things are on the horizon, I assure mm, you. Yes. We are dedicated to small arms history, and uh, again, we appreciate you all every single day. Bruno, do you have any final words? Uh, no, just thank you for all the uh, all the support. All right, we're gonna go get a bite to eat after this, mm. and then we are gonna sleep. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Jeez, I feel all the eyes on me. Okay. Can you smell them all? That helps me. Uh, no, I feel like that make it worse. It'll probably only be like we did not de. We need duct tape. Duct tape. Oh, well, you have, uh, the, you have the monitor on it. Just give me two strips. No, I'm not giving you duct tape. Here, we'll film the intro bit and then we'll do the duct tape. Okay, do that. Okay, go for it, bro. Okay. Hi, I'm not Othias, and this is a slightly different episode.